for a mic and Matt on fire. It's been years since we sat down and had a mic and Matt on fire. And as you can see, if you haven't been following along with Matt McKeever, he has a huge beard now. I do have a giant beard. Um, but yeah, it's good to be back. I, I guess I assumed I would have been on one of these already, but you were saying last night that you don't think you've really ever had a guest or only a couple guests. Yeah, the only guests I think I've had were, were Graham Stephan in the beginning, one of the first episodes ever. And then I think I had a couple of friends in the beginning just to try it. But mm -hmm. I've just never been able to coordinate having guests on the show. So it's very rare to have and someone and such a special guest tonight. I, I figured, you know what, I'm going to break my rule and bring them on. I appreciate it. And just for anyone that doesn't know, like you can go back probably to, well, whenever you started this, but go like a month further back on my YouTube channel. And you'll see me being like, I'm trying to talk Mike into doing a weekly show because I know he'll love it. Da, 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 da. And so you guys really have me to thank for this. You're honestly, yes. Uh, if you go back, like literally, if you go back, what, five, six years ago, Matt mm -hmm. McKeever had dropped his accounting job, had a bunch of real estate, and was like, I'm going all in this idea of social media and it's going to be the future in a big way. And he introduced me to the concept and then gave me the pushes that I needed to go and, and make not only a Instagram channel, but a YouTube channel as well. And so you wouldn't have YouTube today if it wasn't for this guy. He's actually the reason that I did it and stuck with it. And so, um, in in honor of that, we're going to do another Mike and Matt on fire. If you go on his YouTube channel, uh, it, it's Canadian Real Estate yeah, something it, now, the, but the, the same main channel. channel is the Canadian Real Estate channel. That's where all my you know uh, financial independence, retire early, real estate content's there. There's also Matt McKeever Unfiltered, where you're going to get political views and things of that nature. It turns out a lot of real estate investors get triggered by my uh, political views, so we differentiated the brands. That was probably smart, I think, from from overall uh, tactical perspective. Well, we can dive into and... it because like, this is one of the things where earlier today you had a meeting and uh, yeah. I won't get like deep into the details of it, but you know, someone was maybe like either planting a seed or pitching you on the idea of like start a fund or a mic or something in that sort of vein. And uh, I won't say any names, but I've got, you know, different friends and real estate investors that are very successful that have gone on to either launch their own funds, you know, launch their own mix or they're in the process of doing so. And I guess like one of my big questions or one of my big, uh, I guess, moments of hesitation towards that is like one of them, literally the way they're setting up their fund, it's going to be ESG compliant because they want to attract large, large institutional investors. I hate that idea. And yet, like, if you want to maximize the fund, it's actually a very smart choice, right? To like lean into that sort of policy. But, you know, I was saying to you uh, either last night or earlier today, the point of FU money is to get to actually tell people FU. And I find so many people end up becoming, you know, we hear about these golden handcuffs when it comes to a job. And it's like, oh, like they're paying me so much. My bonus is so good. I can't quit now. Or I've got this pension, whatever the thing happens to be. Or you're like on the strings of a puppet, yeah. right? Like and so like, I honestly find a lot of entrepreneurs end up building their businesses to such a scale that they end up like with that golden handcuff syndrome. It's just a slightly different version of it. So yeah, I'd be curious, like, Let's say you decide to launch a fund, Mike, or a MIC, or whatever it happens to be. Are you just going to focus on maximizing the returns there? In which case, like leaning into things like ESG is honestly the wise thing to do. You'll be able to attract more capital, not less, because of that. And yet, I won't uh, push my politics on you, but I suspect deep down in your heart of hearts, you probably don't necessarily agree with a lot of diversity, equity initiatives, right? Or a lot of ESG oriented uh, uh, initiatives. So, like, I don't know, it just, I think oftentimes like the best way to grow is be outside your comfort zone. And so a lot of people overcommit, which is a wise path, but in that overcommitment, they end up having to oftentimes compromise. I think, and why, by the way, guys, if you're just joining now, throw your comments down below. If you have any questions yeah. specifically for Matt, um, the intro to this is like, we'll talk about all of that in a second. I'm going to answer why I think it might be smart or not smart. And philosophically, I'm still struggling myself. Um, with that. So I'll get to that in a sec. But Well, if you're struggling with it, it's because you haven't done enough research. But anyways, keep going. <laughs> um, okay, so throw any questions down you have below if you want to know like why Matt like sold everything and moved up to where North Nestor Falls, Nestor Falls, yeah. Ontario, um, and bought this pretty awesome uh, resort they got to tour today and see all the cabins and they're all renovated beautifully. You've got to come and check this out if you're coming by this way across Canada, like I'm doing across Canada tour right now. So I stopped in to, for a couple nights to visit with Matt. And if you're doing that, you should definitely stop in. So um, I'm just going to like shamelessly plug that because it was I it's actually that. way, my expectations were not like it, it well blew up my expectations out of the water, like modern amenities, 
it's just like an amazing, amazing, um, they're in their first full summer, so it's going to be awesome. Our first, yeah, year of like renting it out and stuff. And essentially what I'm trying to do here is convince Mike that resort hacking is the new house hacking. That seed has already been kind of ruminating <laughs> in my head for a while, so I don't think it's going to take a lot. And yeah. he's already kind of convinced me that I need maybe a resort in the Bahamas, maybe one in Florida to fly between, and then maybe one in, in Ontario, maybe two in Ontario. Maybe a few. It's wise to have a few bases. It's good to have to spread your eggs around. And I think that this is this is the ultimate house hack, right? Like at the end yeah, of the day, it that's, literally is. There, there's no the better same house principles hack. apply. Yeah, honestly, like you're still trying to run within the same sort of uh, like financial metrics, right, or the same sort of constraints. So, yeah, I I really encourage people to uh, seriously consider it because you know house hacking usually is an end to a means for a lot of people, right? It's like a stepping stone. Whereas with resort hacking, I think. Like we were saying earlier, in my mind, everyone that comes here, they're at a peak state. As in, like, you know, this is them kind of at their best. This is them relaxing. This is them, you know, enjoying themselves. This is why they work so hard is yeah. to be able to come and appreciate the sort of amenities or experiences that we can offer. And if you can make that your baseline, why wouldn't you want to make that your baseline? Yeah, I mean, it's I can't see why you wouldn't. Um, question just because, like, I was curious and the audience is curious. Would you share, like, how much a, a resort that's got, like, like a 17 sites on it or something in total with the cabins? Sure. What would something yeah. like that cost? I'll run here? the basic numbers here and I'll give you an example of like a few that are even nearby that in theory you could buy today. Um, so the property we're on here, we've got eight cabins, we've got main lodge plus about 10 RV sites. So yeah, Michael. I'm kind of hardwired in, but I just wanted to show you guys a little bit of like some of the cabins over there. I'm in the three bedroom cabin. Right over, here, there, over there with its own private water area it's just beautiful and they've got like a sandy beach a beautiful lake mm -hmm. they've got amenities a sauna a hot tub yoga room we had like national geographic earlier today where like a snapping turtles laying its yes, eggs that actually that, that, that did to, happen um so yeah anyways so what, what did it cost yeah Break a property down. like this if you're and let's say you want to actually bring it up to you know a uh, decent condition and just like a lot of the house hacking that we were attracted to or a lot of the Burr projects previously, um, the same principles apply here. I would say for like about a million dollars all in, you could find something very similar that's going to be like turnkey um, to what I've got here. Obviously, I paid less. We were doing a bunch of sweat equity and work into the project. There's a, uh, a boat only access um, hunting and fishing lodge that's like within an hour, an hour and a half commute from where we currently are that you could buy today for under a million dollars. And it's got, uh, it's on like a private island. It's got six cabins, a main lodge, all that jazz, a fleet of boats. So again, there's a lot of interesting opportunities here. And I guess what I like about it is it scratches a lot of different itches for me. So again, the same financial principles that are attractive about house hacking still work in this scenario. I think that you end up getting a higher quality of life even than the majority of house hacking situations that you'd otherwise be presented with. And then beyond that, you know, my inner doomsdayer is like, if the world goes to hell in a handbasket, I've got a giant lake to fish and I don't necessarily have to uh, you can worry. Hunt too. Yeah, like I don't have to worry land. about the zombie hordes and things like that because, uh, you know, the nearest major population center would be Winnipeg and that's like a four hour drive. So it, it'd take zombies quite a while to commute. To and then joint. you do have this high point here up on this main lodge where you could just snipe them yeah. as they come in, right? Exactly. We've got some hills, uh, some, yeah, great vantage points. So you could find something like this. Like, what would you share roughly what you paid for this thing in, in a range, maybe? So sure. Well, see, and like, like I said, like, I think like a million dollars all in, you can get something pretty turnkey. I bought this for six. Um, we'll probably end up spending close to uh, three or 400,000 total in investment, but I personally think it'll be worth a lot more than that. But the biggest question, you know, at the end of the day, when you're trying to think of like, what's the ARV on this is what do you value the income potential, right? So again, this isn't necessarily your basic um, yeah, what rental you, real what estate. What could you produce here? Like, what, what kind of income could you do on an annual basis or even in the summer, like over the good yeah, months? Yeah, I, I think if you were to shorten the period, so we're year round here, I'm not saying that that's uh, the path that necessarily a lot of like resort hacking individuals would want to go. But for our for us, I think once we get up to full capacity, full operations, I would think that we should be able to get somewhere in the 200,000 gross revenue from it. Um, it. You know, the margin is going to come down to whether you want to self-operate or not, right? So a lot of individuals will make that choice or whether you want a full-time employee. I think that there's a certain level where if you really want to lean into the resort hacking idea, you're going to want to be probably producing 200,000 plus in gross revenue because 
that'll probably give you enough uh, profit to have a full-time employee. Where I think that like, to me, you could buy something similar to this, but smaller, and it would be in that awkward, like non-Goldilocks zone, in my opinion, where it's like, there's like three or four cabins. Well, you can't really afford to have like a full-time live-in operator in that situation. Or if you're going to do it yourself, you're probably going to be like below the Canadian median income, which again, you I don't think it's- scale. Yeah, really so I think like getting to the eight plus rental units um, on your resort, it, generically speaking, that's probably where you want to be if you want to be able to outsource the management and yet still have competent management, right? Because that's the other aspect. The thing that's crazy to me that, that is blowing my mind is that you can find something like this in maybe a more rural location, like maybe an hour out of a major city for like, say, a million dollars all in. A lot of the properties in Toronto, Vancouver, you know, many major metropolitan are a million or two. So you could trade your house for well, like yeah. a 15-unit like, resort. Like, I was scrolling on Instagram the other week about uh, Tilsonburg, and the average house in Tilsonburg is like, it was like 560 or 650, something absurd. And I'm just like, so I can buy a small town which I essentially You're feel basically like I mayor did, of a small town right? here. Like that's what you Or have. you could buy like a shitty McMansion in Tilsonburg. And nothing wrong with Tilsonburg. I love Crokinoe as much as the next person. My family's but, from Tilsonburg. <laughs> it's not great. But it it, it just honestly doesn't make sense, um, in my opinion. And so yeah, food for thought. Okay. And by the way, guys, we had like 70 people on. I mean, people are gonna jump on and off. If you're gonna jump off, just hit the like button for me. That'd be cool. Let the algorithm know that you're getting some value here. And any of the the deep dirty deets you want, like is Matt still investing in real estate outside of this? Yeah. Or like, as always, I'm an worth, open book. I'd like to think that's you know, always crypto, been the case. All that. Uh, jump those dirty questions in here and philosophical stuff too. We're looking for some uh, some nice balls. So throw us some nice, uh, lob us some nice uh, home runs. Hey guys, how you doing? Good to see you guys all on here. A lot of the regulars popping in. Tank beard fam. <laughs> one for you there. Yeah, so I yeah, don't have a tank one beard, that's so. like Matt's been in the sun. I see 420 <laughs> Matt, so obviously a, a, someone that was a fan of uh, Matt McKeever Marijuana Monday Madness. That was a that was a good little series you had running there. I enjoyed it. You got yeah. pretty loose. It, it was fun to yeah, just kind of go extremely off script and just hang out with people, and it kind of gave me permission to explore a broad range of topics, which I think is fun. Okay, I got one here from William saying, how did Matt get his first 20 properties? Just give like a big overview of like where you came sure. from to so, here. Yeah, the the fastest way for me to uh, present it would be just go watch the YouTube videos I've already done on it. But essentially, um, the first three properties I bought that were rentals, well, I guess the very first one was a house hack. After that, it was three student rentals. Then I started getting into the Burr investment strategy. Um, the trajectory of my growth as a real estate investor drastically changed once I was able to Fat, like quickly recycle my money, which is what the burn investment strategy is all about. So, um, you know, within the first year of quitting my full uh, time job, I think I acquired 32 units. Uh, one of those was like a small 20 unit parcel of bachelor apartments, and the rest was like small duplexes, triplexes, sixplexes, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's roughly how I got to the first 20 units or 20 properties. And once you got there, you kind of to run people through what happened. You got to a point where you went all in on growth for a while. Yeah. People were following you. You were like and all in on social media. Like, I really enjoy experimenting in and the learning process. So I started a lot of different businesses in a very short period of time. I just said yes to pretty much every opportunity, whether it was a networking opportunity, a business opportunity, investment opportunity. And uh, I think what that allowed me to do was really compress the amount of uh, time that it took to gain a wide spectrum of experience. So, you know, I think with everything, if you had a time machine, you'd always find ways to finesse or tweak probably your approach. But for myself, like you can go back and watch all my YouTube videos back when I was sh uh, sharing my monthly budgets and being like, I spend less than $2,000 and this is my peak lifestyle. Like I honestly didn't know what I would change back then. You can look today and my spending's a little bit different, but actually the dollar amounts are still actually right in line. I definitely don't spend more than $2,000 a month. So it was never about the money. It was all about the experience and even just challenging myself. So, you know, at peak between like employees, contractors, stuff like that, the different businesses, like well over like 50 employees or contractors working between the different- 50 employees, wow. Yeah, well think about it. Like I had two houses where people were like living full time. Then I had cash flow tribe with Ben Wright. And right, right. I had like a foundation capital where we were buying apartment buildings and we had full time employees there. So it was actually a lot. It, I. It was probably too much too fast for myself if I wanted to build it sustainably. But honestly, I didn't know what would succeed and what would fail. And again, it wasn't necessarily like 
the money's a bonus and like everyone says that very few people honestly mean it I, i'd like to think that you can look at my track record and see that i truly mean it because um again the idea of like selling everything and just going to my business partners and saying like make me an offer and accepting essentially whatever like i didn't renegotiate with anyone that made me an offer or a counter offer um because like the relationships there and just being there? able can to you walk me through how you went from like you were like a couple of years ago, we were chatting. And you were all in mm -hmm. on growth and business, and you had really lofty goals. And then something happened. Was yeah, a mindset shift. Did, or? Uh, yeah, and you might have just not noticed it, but in 2020, the world went crazy. And uh, so is that what led to the? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I leaned into that craziness as well, where I was like, "This is insane that our governments are locking us down, that they're penalizing us." You know, I won't get into deep details, but like, I got fined for crossing back into Canada without a. Uh, a vaccine passport, right, without proof of my vaccine by my own government. It technically was like a, I don't want to misspeak here. I want to say it was like $5,600 fine. Did you get an apology um, letter now that they've realized that, you know, no, research no, is No, absolutely not. To... I got a stern lecture from the prosecutor and had to like kind of eat shit if I wanted her to downgrade the total financial fine. And honestly, I'm still conflicted with myself. Did you pay I, it? Well, I ate shit, and so they knocked it down significantly. I still haven't paid it because they haven't mailed it to me yet, but that's just because they're so inefficient with our system. But anyways, I won't get too far down that rabbit hole, but I started <laughs> to realize, like, I guess to tie this back into Mike's YouTube channel and the regular content you're used to, honestly, like, the point of financial independence for me, and I believe it was for you, Mike, as well, was, like, the idea of freedom. Like, that's why, like, financial freedom is such an important concept. It's such a core aspect of FIRE, and... I realized that I built up this like empire in my opinion. Again, some there's lots of uh, entrepreneurs that have done much better than myself. I'm not saying that I'm necessarily unique in that aspect, but I realized that that actually was a giant vulnerability where like people could control you. And like I got phone calls from business partners that were upset because of my political opinions I was sharing on social media because they were afraid it could cost us future capital investment. And like. I had one business partner that, um, like, not on social media in any way, and I called out there was a law firm in London, Ontario, that was one of the first companies in Canada to implement a vaccine passport for their employees, uh, like a requirement for their employees in order to work. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, it was the McKenzie Law Firm, and, like, I called them out, and a, a friend of mine reached out, and he's um, a very successful accountant. He was like, yo, you shouldn't be saying this. Like, I can set up a meeting with you and that partner, and you guys can like maybe try and chat through this and like understand his side. And I was like, no, there's no like, there's no good side to medical fascism. And so for me, being able to kind of like release myself from any of those debts where, you know, I really did take pride in having good relationships with all my different business partners. I don't think there's a single person that got into business with Matt McKeever that can say I did wrong by them or they didn't financially win based upon their investment with me. And I want to be able to like, essentially like, clear all those debts, move on, and be able to say whatever I wanted without any consequences. Because again, some of these business partners, they didn't necessarily sign up for my political opinions. I can respect that to a certain extent. I do think it's unfortunate that more individuals with FU money don't choose to proactively speak out and say FU to the system. Because I think that's where we end up with this, like a version of the tragedy of the commons where individuals, like, everyone's like, well, it's not really my job to speak out. I'm just going to focus on making a little bit more money for me. I can buy myself a second passport. I can buy another property in another country. I'll, I'll choose to shop around individually versus, like, actually standing behind your principles and your ethics and morals. And again, it, it's very easy for this to sound preachy. Um, but for myself, that's just my personal value matrix when I look at the world. I think it's a really interesting point. And, and for me, it hits home too. Like during this pandemic, I had I had similar issues where I was vocal about my how much I detested what the government was doing and how much I, I felt that you know they were overstepping certain boundaries. And I was I was fairly vocal about it on my Instagram channel, and I got a shadow ban on there. Yeah, and I still have a shadow like, ban warning on Facebook. There was significant consequences to my YouTube channel and the income yeah. we were generating. And I had multiple employees that yeah. like they made the reason I could justify their salaries was because we made a bunch of money on YouTube. And because we like, I valued the impressions and the relationships I was building with my audience and to see like myself trying to speak out against those things and then immediately being penalized for it. Like you start to think like, 
Well, I might have to let someone go if I keep saying my political opinions, because if we get demonetized completely or we get banned from YouTube, and there's lots of Canadian content creators that have been banned from YouTube because they share, you know, opinions about COVID or political opinions that weren't appropriate at the time that with hindsight actually don't seem that crazy, right? Like whether you're talking about like the lab leak theory or like the effectiveness of vaccines and things of that nature. Now, don't get me wrong. There's also a lot of people out there that are batshit crazy that like went way down the conspiracy rabbit hole. And I don't think they did themselves any, uh, any good going that extreme either. So there's Did you a, go too far down the rabbit hole? There's a balance there. And I definitely understand why individuals go too far down that rabbit hole because when you start, like I literally called it a, uh, um, like a uh, psychotic break where you have to completely reinterpret your understanding of reality. Because for the longest time, I thought you play within the set of rules that everyone understands. You make a bunch of money and you essentially get to buy your freedom. And I'm not saying it's a perfect system, but I was like, eh, good enough. I'm willing to like do that because I value my freedom to such an extent. And I feel like I, I played that game for 15 plus years and then realized like, oh no, they can still take your freedom whenever you want. And that's very frustrating at a minimum. And I think that, you know, a lot of individuals like experience that. And then you start questioning everything and you're like, maybe they are reptiles. Maybe they are, <laughs> you know, drinking baby's blood and all that stuff. And I understand why people end up down that trajectory because they start questioning things where they're like, no, I'm personally experiencing this. My personal experiences don't line up with the mainstream narrative. What other conclusion am I to come to other than to jump to the opposite extreme? Which again, I don't think it, uh, serves well as a general like basis for navigating reality. But I, I do em empathize, I guess, at a minimum with those individuals. Yeah, I think that's all. That entire speech was well uh, put. And I think there's a lot of, just to add to that, there's a lot of pressure I think we get as business owners and as, you know, with our social networks, we find a lot of that pressure to do what is socially acceptable. And the mm -hmm. whole point of the FU money, again, just to reiterate that, why we got into this, why we found, you know, early retirement extreme, we set our lives on this course of deprivation, I guess, and a new way of yeah. thinking was to have the freedom when that moment came to speak how we wanted to speak, to act how we wanted to act. And that may come at a you know, there may be some sacrifices with that, but everything has a sacrifice. Yeah, and everything in life is a trade-off, right? Yeah. And I guess, like, the the oversimplification of everything I've said here is just, like, I reinterpreted, like, the trade-offs. And I decided to approach it in a different manner. 100%. But, uh... Okay, we're going to the next I question. I guess, like, yeah. Or no, keep and going. No, you find another good question, but I'll throw out a question while you're doing that, just to the audience in general. Um, I shared on my Instagram earlier this week... I personally think the greatest risk to real estate investors right now, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. It's not the greatest risk. Okay, I'm, I'm the largest risk, the biggest risk there is. It's not interest rates. You know, it's not um, rent freezes or rent moratoriums or anything like that. It's not green belts. It, in my opinion, it literally just comes down to the risk of regulators. And I think that landlords make for a very easy scapegoat in times of you know financial uncertainty. I think we're going to see a lot more pressure on the cost of housing. The average Canadian already spends about 30, 40% of their income on shelter. I think there's a chance that we're going to actually see that trend up higher. I think people will be very angry by that. I think that certain political parties, like whether it's the more extreme uh, liberals or NDPs or the Green Party, will be able to capitalize on that. And I think that we'll, we at least stand a non zero risk of like, substantial socialist oriented policies toward housing being implemented over the next decade. And I think that the average landlord, if you want to be a long-term real estate investor, you're doing yourself a disservice by not being proactive and starting to get involved in politics, right? Like I, I, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, okay, London, Ontario passes rental license. Well, what are you going to do? Right. That's just the way the game goes. You and then out and you try to go to council you meetings. You sort of, but like the average person doesn't, right? Yeah, like we all do? just kind of bitch about it and we go, what can you do? And then they pass rules about Airbnb and then they pass like heritage rules. And what ends up happening is like the bureaucracy just chokes any sort of innovation, any real, um, you know, entrepreneur oriented uh, solutions towards that. And I think that, you know, what Kayla Andre is doing with Ontario Landlords Watch and those different organizations. Like, it's really easy for those of us that are making money to just be like, I'm just going to stick in my lane. I'm just going to get while the getting's good. I'm not going to worry about it. But I think, you know, what she's doing is actually really important. If you want to be a landlord either today or for the next 10 years or 10 years from now, you need to start supporting people like Kayla and different organizations that are at least trying to create 
more financial literacy and understanding to the general public about why housing is so expensive. It's not greedy landlords. I swear to God, it's not. It's also not greedy foreigners. It's all the crazy fiat monetary policies we're implementing as a country, right? In every Western civilization. Just to chime in on that, like my original, I agree with a lot of what you're saying that, that having a voice is important and we mm -hmm. need to be supporting those who are having a voice for us like what the Ontario Landlord Watch is doing. Yeah. And there are other groups that are supporting that too. And the thing I always subscribe to is like, the thing that, like I always thought the system was broken because I grew up in poverty and I realized how horrible Canada was from mm -hmm. growing up on that, in that bottom quarter of the population. But instead of like saying, oh, poor me, there's a system I can't break. I was like, how can I have impact and change? So when I like, basically my why for continuing to go past fire and go into like Lux fire and keep going is like, just being able to influence the world to my liking in a way, so to speak. But so like, that's what this can provide, right? It's like you could buy your own resort and then you're sort of isolated from a lot of that, right? Well, like, and don't get me wrong, I, like there's a certain coward's uh, solution that I'm taking, right? By being like, okay, the cities are crazy. I'm just going to go buy in the middle of nowhere and I'll just like flee there's, there's the problem. There's an appeal to that though. Like, no, absolutely there's an appeal. But like, I guess I would push back on you, Mike. And again, this is nothing personal, but if like, I don't disagree that probably your intentions to want lux fire or more resources is thinking you can like influence society or the world in a more positive manner. But like, other than creating content, like, is there any examples, right? Like, are there any charities that you actually back, whether it's with your time or your money or even just giving them shout outs, right? Like, do you even do due diligence on that shit? And I'll be honest, like, I'm not perfect at this shit either. So I'm not like holier than thou by any means, but I think that a lot of us you know, once you get to fire or your past fire, I think that we all need to challenge ourselves more to think outside of just running up the high score when it comes to monetary value. And like, not a criticism of you. This is literally just a criticism of what I see with so many fire oriented individuals. Like, we're like, once I get 5,000 a month, once I get 10,000 a month, once I get 20,000 a month, right, then, then I'll figure out what I want out of life, then I'll like go on my real passion projects. And honestly, a lot of us fall victim to just increasing that number consistently. And uh, again, if you're happy with that, I'm not throwing stones at your glass house because I definitely live in a glass house myself. But I, I think that a lot of us are capable of even more. And I would just challenge you guys, myself, Mike, everyone else in the fire community to, you know, really think about could, could you divert a certain amount of your resources, whether it's your time, your energy, your money, um, towards supporting causes that are going to you know, foster or at least allow the next generation to operate the way we did, right? Like, I, I'm very happy I grew up in Canada that like, I could build a real estate portfolio, I could, like, in the generation that we are, you could work really hard, and it would pay off. Like, that's actually really cool. And that's a very rare sliver of history, where you could consistently count on that playing out in that manner. And I fear that whether it's a decade or several decades from now, we'll either find ourselves so handicapped because of good intentions, but wrong policies, or just because we run ourselves off the economic cliff that is the fiat currency system, and that individuals won't necessarily be able to have the same feedback loop and the feedback system that we did that allowed us to succeed in the manner we did. I'll admit I'm a bit of a coward in the sense that like, and I, I could do a lot more <laughs> and I don't. And like my, my pursuits right now are like, my three kids, my family, trying to mm -hmm. like, to be honest, a lot of my time is spent scheming on how to escape Canada. Um, I spent a lot of time going into like tax loopholes between like living in the Bahamas as a tax resident, maybe like hanging out in Florida a bit and coming back to Canada as a non-tax resident so that they wouldn't have any strings. And, and you brought up a good point earlier about compliance, right? Like that's the only reason I haven't come up with a fund is one, like the cost in the beginning is so high. Mm -hmm. Two, I don't think the ROI is all that strong unless you get really big. And then to get big, you have to be consistent for a really, really long time. And I'm the type of person who likes to be nimble. And I think you yep, brought that point up. Like, I value like being degrees able to pivot. of freedom or yeah, the ability to pivot's huge. And I think that that's, that's a big piece of it. Right. And I, I'm sure that we could discuss this at great length, but like, when is it enough? Right. And like mm -hmm. that number has changed for me. I, my life has also changed. So like I'm currently supporting my mom and my dad, both in separate houses. And I have three kids independent. So my, my fire number is bigger than when I retired initially. And so I'm, I'm glad in many senses that I'm able to do that. And I'm thankful and blessed that I'm able to actually provide those opportunities for people. And my burn rate is probably much, much higher, five times higher than what it was before because of that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like the things that I'm passionate about currently, as long as if there's a way I can make a profit out of that, that's like a bonus. So I've always tried to like align things that I really enjoy. Like as an mm -hmm. example, I like negotiating and I like 
experiencing and learning new things. And so if I can align, by the way, we just got 102 concurrent live people on the stream. I think we've only ever crossed 100 once ever before. Nice. So it's the second it. time in history we've ever crossed 100. Uh, and that was when I had that interview on CBC. Uh, oh, ABC. right after, yeah. So like nice. we haven't crossed 100 in a long time. So obviously everyone wants to hear what's up with Matt McKeever and like, I think people are going to be curious. And in hey, the if people want to hear my anti-government rants, I'm happy to rant to you about how terrible the government is. I saw a really good question about, uh, you were talking about, you know, the fiat currency collapse towards the end of your, mm -hmm. your speech there. And uh, I think it's a good segue. I saw a question about cryptocurrency here. I'm just going to try to pick it out because I thought it was a good segue about, you know, the collapse of fiat or... I guess it's designed to collapse, right? Because we inflated at 2 to 3% a year minimum, and yeah, eventually well, that leads to yeah, collapse. Right? I think there's like, a lot of different things people need to parse out about fiat currency. And so, one, you know, there's this normalcy bias all of us fall victim to. And a big aspect of that is like, well, it's always been this way. And it's like, no, 1971, things became absolutely different here in the Western world. What happened? And so, well, gold yeah, standard. that's literally when the US defaulted on the gold standard. Uh, the TLDR is like, France was like, yo, we want our gold back. And America was like, nah. And so essentially, like, you had this huge run on the US dollar because at that point in time, pre-1971, you could exchange it, right? And so... I believe if you go to the website like WTF 1971, it'll actually lay out for you an excellent, a, like a much better uh, explanation of this situation than myself. But yeah, like literally the, when the government says that they're trying to manage inflation at 2%, that's them saying, we're only going to try and steal 2% of your money this year secretly from you. And when it accidentally ends up being 8 or 10%, well, they accidentally stole 8 or 10% of your money from you on top of all the crazy taxes you already pay. And again, I have no problem with people entering into voluntary exchanges of value. So like, you know, if you get value from your local fire department, your police services, whatever, absolutely, you should give them money and they should provide a service. But the moment it becomes involuntary, which is what all taxation is, right? Taxation literally is theft. And I think for myself, it just, I hit a tipping point where I was just like, I pay so much, and yet it never actually feels like the individuals we're paying taxes to are serving us. It literally feels like, you know, they're our sovereigns, that, like, we should be thankful that they at least throw us a few bones every now and then. But when it comes to fiat currency, you know, it, it frustrates me that so many individuals complain about the cost of housing here in Canada without understanding that that's a byproduct of our monetary policies, right? And whether you're looking at, like, MMT or just, bait, like, uh, modern monetary theory or whether you're just looking at like basic concept of fiat currency, there's never been a government that hasn't been tempted in the history of society. The moment they were on a non-hard currency, a fiat currency in that case, and fiat is just by dictate, right? That's literally what it means. The government tells you it's valuable, so therefore it is. There's never been a government that didn't end up choosing to inflate its weight, right? And right now I'm listening to a great audio book called When Money Dies, and it's literally just exploring what happened in Weimar, Germany, um, during their crazy inflation, right? And like, you know, peak craziness, you could walk into a cafe and your coffee, when you ordered it, might cost 4,000 marks. But by the time you went to pay for it, it was actually 8,000 marks. And like, that's the sort of thing that happens. And what ends up happening in that scenario is it becomes a low trust society, right? If you can't trust your money to be a store of value. You can't do business. Right? Yeah, you can't do anything, right? And it naturally incentivizes people to behave in bad ways. They're, you know, um, counterproductive to society. So, uh, yeah, I'd encourage individuals, if you haven't looked into any of that, like whether you decide to go down the rabbit hole of like Ludwig uh, von Mises and Austrian economics, whether you choose to read about Bitcoiners, right, and like the Bitcoin standard, or whether you just want to become a his historian buff and like look at things like Weimar Germany and like why did the Weimar Republic end up getting into such crazy inflation uh, scenarios? And like, it's because they had too many debts they had a fiat currency where they were like, yeah, we could just inflate our way out of this problem. And it's what happens in Zimbabwe. It's why Argentina's unstable, all those different things. This, people bring up good points and jumping in here. It's like, can they change it themselves? What can they do today to influence the world? And like part of that, I think, segueing into the question I was going to pick out, which is like, where is Matt's current asset allocation today? We knew you were in big into real estate. You maybe yeah. sold it or you're into like Bitcoin now. And yeah, bit and so, yeah, I'm a huge believer in Bitcoin. Um, if you're like... Right now, if you're like, what's cryptocurrency? Please, I, I implore you, only look into Bitcoin. Do not get distracted by the charlatans. Do not get distracted by DGEN, Dogecoins, or shitcoins, or NFTs. Again, you can make money in those markets, but understand, it's honestly like the stock market, but it's more stacked. So in the stock market, in my opinion, only insiders make real alpha. 
And when it comes to shit coins and NFTs, again, only insiders make real alpha. Where Bitcoin is honestly a truly decentralized solution to a store of value. And that's what we need, right? Like the average person, honestly, like it frustrates me that the average person has to become a real estate investor. They have to get involved in stock trading. They have to get involved in Forex if they want to be able to like earn their way out of having to work full time, right? You should actually just be able to count that like, if I worked hard today, I should be able to save some of the resources I produced and count on them tomorrow. And because of fiat currency, because of inflation, you actually can't count on that. Your dollar is less valuable so than like, your guys it, by like 10%. Yeah. And it literally cases. forces you. Sorry, we're literally outside here. I saw someone said green screen, definitely not a green screen. The mosquitoes are here to prove it. Yeah, um, it's, it's real. Um, that's actually the water. Like, you know, there's actually cabins here. That's actually my 400 uh, plus feet of waterfront. Um, Shameless plug. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I would just encourage individuals become more educated about it because in my opinion, there was just a moment during COVID where like my mind broke. I went through that psychotic break of like, this is not okay. Like, why did I work so hard to then still be told about everything, right? Like, how dare I have four people over to my house because the government said you were only allowed two at that moment. Did you time. remember that? They're like, how dare you go for a walk outside yeah, by we yourself? Had, we had neighbors in rat the forest. on us, right? And like Adam Martin got a ticket for sitting on a bench in a park neighbors by himself. Neighbors are like calling, like, yeah. I think he's walking in the forest by himself. <laughs> it's a danger to everyone around. And like, I had a coworker, um, I had a series of coworkers. I made a post during, during the, pro this was like maybe 2021. So like what, maybe a year and a half ago, right at the peak lockdown where I was just leaving to Florida. And I had coworkers that were my previous bosses and like a bunch of people worked at Infotech jump on and like literally someone said, you better off dead, Mike. Like you're, you're the problem with society. Like you're, you're killing everyone. And I, I literally was just like so calm about it. It was like, let's look at the data. Mm -hmm. And like, let's talk about the pro con because this isn't for everyone. And they're like, I can't believe you. You're a murderer going out and like contaminating people. Like my great grandma's going to die because of you. And like, there's just so much fear and yeah. anger. And like, there's still no apology, by the way. Like a lot of these people well, called me out or like said that I was, that I was like an evil person, right? Mm -hmm. And that I should be dead and that I should, yeah, you know, I was evil and all like, so I much remember some language. of the YouTube comments and like, Instagram comments back in that day. And I, I get that it was coming from a, a, a place of fear, as you were saying, right? But like, the data now shows they were wrong. And, and there's still no recant of like, hey, we went too far. It's like, mm -hmm. no, 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 it's like, it's okay. Yeah, and there was just no desire to seek truth, right? They wanted to be on the right side of history rather than focusing being on the right side of the truth. And that to me just frustrates me to no end because that's, that's what so much of our society is at this point in time, empty virtue signaling, right? Like I, one of the reasons I'm so attracted to Bitcoin, one of the reasons I think that it should be a part of everyone's portfolios is it's a way to actually, in my opinion, take a concrete step to starving the parasite class and that's literally what the government is. They are the parasite class. They're the individuals that they don't produce, they only take. And I would strongly encourage individuals that again, aren't familiar with history, spend a little bit of time, look into that. And uh, yeah, anyways, I'll leave that for now, but. Uh, the second part of that question was after you sold everything, got into cryptocurrencies, how does your current net worth look as opposed to, oh, bug in the eye. That's how you know it's not a green screen. Yeah. Um, how does the current net worth look? Like what is your current asset allocation? Uh, to stocks or real estate or businesses? What are you currently still yeah, have so, businesses still or? Um, I don't like, I'm in a couple little small like micro or angel investments. They're just in businesses or people I really believe in. Um, they'll probably turn into nothing. So again, that to me is more like betting on the relationship than anything beyond that. Um, outside of that, Bitcoin, this property, right? Like and uh, just kind of waiting for the right next opportunity is a big part of what I'm focused on as well. So I like- So what is that for you? Like, where do you see opportunity right now? Yeah, um, so I shared this actually recently on my Instagram, but, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, Mike, but like the trends that I think have a lot of opportunity or upside in the future, the obvious ones right now to me are Bitcoin, it's um, uh, AI, right, and AR, so like, uh, artificial intelligence, the chat GPT, all that crazy shit, as well as like AR. I know right now everyone's trying to dunk on uh, um, Apple because they released like the $3,500. Yeah, like a $4,000. Yeah. And sure, but all technology is expensive at the start. But I think that augmented reality probably, one, it's probably more preferable, but certainly it's more likely to play out in a bigger way than complete virtual reality, at least in the short term. So I think those are interesting. But outside of that, some... Other just like concepts that I'm spending time thinking about and studying is I think like used goods and estate settlements are going to become a big business as we see like boomers die off, as we see terrible, 
you know, green policies implemented, they're going to make transportation costs far more uh, significant and uh, detrimental to shipping things across large regions. Canada, we've got low population density. So again, I think that there's just some unique opportunities and spaces like that. Now, as far as like what business do I launch tomorrow because of it, I, I don't have an answer for you guys. One of the things I think I know about the future for myself is I don't want to necessarily be an operator. So I'd much more like to be the, you know, the guy behind the curtain, maybe a string puller, something like that, right? Or honestly, it's more likely what it plays out is just me, you know, uh, consulting, giving my thoughts and opinions and mentoring individuals. There's a handful of Canadian uh, content creators right now that I spend time with just like um, chatting about them, their content and how to try and take it to the next level. Because I, I think, unfortunately, right now, there's not a lot of good political discourse in Canada, whether it's on the left or the right. Um, I think that's true across Western societies in general. But I want to try and help be that change. And so one of the ways I'm trying to do that right now is just investing my time by jumping on like weekly and monthly calls with some of these different content creators. Cool. Okay. What about real estate? Do you see, uh, you kind of gave a yeah, so slow like, way about that. So when it comes to real estate, um, like you can still make money with real estate in Canada. So like, I don't want anyone to misinterpret what I'm about to say next. So I think it's a fine choice, whether you're looking to be a short term or long term investor. Again, if you're going to be a long term investor, I think you need to look at some of those like non zero or tail risks of potential like regulators stepping in. And whether that's just you having a canary in the coal mine and being quick to pivot if and when maybe policy breaks bad. Um, I think that that's good enough. But I guess what's really frustrated me is I, I've spent more time just really studying Austrian economics and things of that bent is like, you know, even like talking about earlier today, the idea of like starting a fund and all the different like fees and regulators and things. Yeah, like, yeah. It just, it honestly is kind of like gibberish. Like it, it, the only reason it's different than like talking about fancy football is because you make money in that world and you don't with fancy football. But like, you're not actually creating like real value to the economy. And no. it frustrates me that shit, right? Because again, like when you burr a property, you create real value, right? Like you rolled up your sleeves, you saw an underperforming asset and you brought it up to its highest, you best added potential units, value. You added bedrooms, yeah. you, you made more space for people to live, you accommodated yeah. people. But like you generated real mm -hmm. value in my yep. opinion, or at least the way we burr properties or the way I used to burr properties. We weren't that was speculators, we, yeah. were, we were but adding like, value. Now our economic policies are such that in my opinion, it really incentivizes like speculating, right? And that's, we were talking about like PE ratios of companies and stuff. It's absurd. NVIDIA guys, <laughs> 200 price to earnings over 10 times uh, annual sales, like what? Yeah, and so like those things, it's just, it's very difficult for me to rationalize that. I And I'm at the point where either like, you know, thankfully I'm so blessed that I don't have to, or I'm so crazy that I choose not to participate in those markets. So like public equities, None. And I have zero, like I may, I probably have like whatever, 20 grand and a random old RSP. But outside of that, that's my only exposure to public equities. Um, I don't have any debt, like no mortgages or things like that. Because again, I just, I don't even want to participate in those systems. And I don't think I have to. But that leads back to if I was trying to maximize my financial position, it would actually be smart to take on debt, even at these interest rates, because it's still on the broad scale, historically very cheap, right, to get debt in this market. But I just, you know. Oh, we didn't talk about the debt today. Um, oh, yeah, what the happened bank today? Raise. Yeah, so we had 25 basis points. I think only uh, one in five economists in Canada were predicting it, so they were kind of caught flat-footed when it came to that. I was uh, talking to three bankers yesterday. I locked in some rates yesterday, and they're like, oh, you don't need to lock in. Like, it's going down. It's trending down. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> go lock me in some rates. Like, rates are going to go up. Uh, inflation is actually rising. Core is like, again, we've seen core inflation go from 3.9 mm -hmm. to 4.3. That's a rise month over month. It's sticky. It hasn't been coming down. Yeah. The writing's been on the wall. I've hear, heard a lot of bulls right now say, like a lot of the bulls that I follow in the stock market and in real estate, and it's you have to decipher through that because some of them have bias to invest in their yeah, own funds. Yeah, bag bias. Or they have their own real estate portfolio and they, or they want to raise capital from you and they want you to be bullish on real estate, so they might say things that are, hey, things are going to be great. And the mm -hmm. banks would say that too, right? It's, banks rely heavily on rates coming back down. And so that narrative to them supports what they're doing. And so why would they, you know, go with any yeah. other narrative that, that goes against what they're thinking, right? So it's like, and, and to one other point I wanted to make about five minutes ago, I just remembered, you, those three points you made were great. And I think they're bang on as far as AI, AR, 
um, Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the third one, right? How do you technically Bitcoin was the first one, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so I went in reverse option, <laughs> but like, how do you apply that into your business and into even your real estate portfolio potentially? If you'd like to have some of the real yeah. estate exposure, it's like, well, maybe properties like this, right? Because now if you have uh, what's called Starlink mm -hmm. that Elon Musk put out there, we now have you have gigabit speed internet anywhere in the world. So he has super fast internet. We're in the middle of nowhere. Like you're like miles and miles and miles and you're how long to the nearest grocery store? Like an hour. To like like a, the real grocery the real, store. Like, yeah. Like a real grocery like, store, right? Our grocery store that's like seven minutes away, Mike, you would have a heart attack if you saw some of the prices where you're like, wait, a bag of like $20? Six, <laughs> like, yeah, a bag of six sausage buns costs $10? But I mean, you could still order from Amazon here, right? Yeah, yeah, you can deliver. still get. And so we do Just live do in the digital hauls, age. Right? Like, yeah, and people need to, I think, embrace that, right? Because your cost of living, while, well, you know, anecdotally speaking, that local grocery store might be expensive. Again, let's break it down for where the average Canadian spends most of their money 34% on housing. Well, if you can find a way, whether it's through house hacking, which we're big proponents of, resort hacking, or just living in an extremely low cost of living uh, jurisdiction, if you can get that down Which is to anywhere like, rural, pretty yeah. much. Like your living costs go down 50% at least. And honestly, I think rural people, they're a different type of crazy, but they're more my type of crazy. And I appreciate that as well versus a lot of city folk. And I just don't think that when you actually look at living in a city, that the trade-offs justify choosing that, right? Uh, especially for those that are trying to maximize their financial uh, independence, right? If you want to um, do that in as fast of a period of time as possible, one of the easiest ways to collapse your timeline is move to that lower cost of living area while still implementing a house hacking strategy. I totally agree with all that. And there's ways I think to invest in real estate too. Like as an example, the trend for, you know, working from home with AI and with yeah. um, even with AR, you could actually have meetings in the virtual world that are maybe more effective mm -hmm. and more efficient than driving somewhere, well, and commuting. Yeah, the idea so of like, space might be, yeah, bricks you know, and mortar retail and stuff like that, right? Again, AR might be able to bridge part of the gap there and the experience of like, oh, I want to like try it before I buy it or touch or feel it. Um, that might be, you know, another step in that direction. But I guess circling back, one of the questions I regularly get when I just tell people like, I'm trying to study AI, they're like, what does that mean? What are you even doing there? And my recommendation would be, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Mike, but I would literally just start off like, whether it's, you know, Dolly, whether you're chat GPT, mid journey, whatever, go spend a couple of hours and just literally screw around with it. It like, think about it like the internet, right? Like if, you know, my parents are old, Mike, I won't uh, judge your parents, but like, my parents, if I was to like tell my dad, like, go find this torrent or go find this thing, like he'd have no idea, right? Like he might be able to type in exactly what I told him to Google, but he wouldn't be able to determine like what's the right link to click on in order to get the answer he's seeking, right? So if I was like, you know, find out the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs roster, he might type that into Google, but he's just going to click the first link. Where those of us that have spent more than a couple hours on Google, you realize like, oh, I might actually have to read the headline and the first couple lines in order to find out, is this actually going to provide me the answer I want? And so do the exact same thing with AI, like just play with it, get used to it. I think one of the best exercises is ask AI questions that you already know the answer to. And honestly, at the start, it's probably not going to give you the right answers, but that's going to teach you to get better at prompting it in order to get the right answers. And you'll be able to like, you know, check it because you already know the answers to it. But at the same time, it is interesting. I don't know if you played with it, Mike, but you should do this exercise if you haven't. I've gone into uh, ChatGPT. I said, explain the Burr investment strategy in the style of Matt McKeever. And it did. It didn't do it perfectly, but like, I was pretty impressed. Yeah, it's getting to the point where like, a lot of these, maybe I'm, I'm going to be out of a show and out of a out of an opportunity or, here because you can ask it the forces questions. a different type of content. Yeah, right. I think like people are going to become more relation and personality oriented yeah. versus like the best information. Correct. And uh, you know, I, I honestly like prided myself for a long time on just trying to be factually the best. And I, you know, I, I take pride in the type of content I created, but I think that the only way you can survive in the future is to also focus on that personality and have people like connect with you on a personal level. I think so too. And I think it's a big opportunity for those who aren't, taking a chance to like just dabble in playing with mm -hmm. say chat GPT, just download the app, play with it, ask yeah. it some questions, maybe ask it to do something. Hey, write, write a rental ad for me. And it might be horrible. And then you're like, mm -hmm. actually write a rental ad for, you know, a place with no laundry or with no parking. And it will, you can ask it to do certain things. And it'll it will, get, yeah, it will get honestly get better. And you can ask it like, what makes for a good rental ad? And again, like if it gives you back the wrong answers, figure out how to prompt in such a way to get the right answers because 
I, I think that makes it really easier when you then start exploring AI outside of your comfort house, right? Or your like wheelhouse where you're like, hey, I don't know anything about this subject matter, but I'd love for AI to be able to distill down like the core principles and I can use that as a springboard to like go deeper on my research journey. I have a follower who's working on um, a small project downloading all of my YouTube videos right now into like a, a chatbot that is a Mike Rosehart chatbot. It oh, knows cool. everything from all my <clears throat> videos. So it's gonna have like 500, 500 hours of all my yep. content. So that's something that's gonna be coming soon, guys. Um, I don't know if it'll be kind of a bit janky, but we're gonna try our best to like but do it. It's, again, it's worth experimenting with. and playing with that stuff. Just because... play with it, right? And you can you can get those simple questions answered. And at the end of the day, you can, just by playing in it and becoming familiar, you're mm -hmm. gonna be a step ahead and then three steps ahead as things get more and more advanced yeah. over time. That, By the way, just if you're into like, you know, trending businesses, trending jobs right now, and you're looking to unlock fire still, AI teleprompter is like the number one recruited job that's paying six figures right now. That's oh, crazy because like, it's such an that. easy job. Like it's easier than coding, I would say, because all you have to do is be a good critical thinker. Mm -hmm. Think through how to ask the right questions. Yeah, and right? understand so, like, what AI, like what it's reacting to and stuff. And I'll be honest, like the first hour I screwed around with it, I was like, okay, I kind of get it. And then I spent a couple more hours like asking it the same questions. And like, you know, uh, I was just goofing around, focused on like Airbnb. I feel like I know a fair bit about Airbnb, but I'm not like the absolute expert at it. But I could kind of quickly check whether like its advice was right or not. And for the first hour or two, it was giving me extremely generic answers. And then eventually like I figured out what were the right prompts and had it writing essays where I was like, ooh, this is probably as good or better than any of the content I ever produced on uh, Airbnb or I know I could create even better content now that I've had the inputs from this chat GPT. And I think that that's where right now in this moment in time, where the greatest opportunity is, is that you can maximize it while still adding your own flair to it. So again, I think that the best type of content isn't going to be pure, just AI driven, like spewing it out. It's still going to have that human touch or flair where you're going to figure out like, okay, but like this is the hook or this is a way to slightly reinterpret this data point and present it in an even more meaningful or impactful way for the audience. So to sum up that last bit of um, that question, you circled around having almost no stock investments besides some registered accounts yeah. a long time ago. You have some small angel investments. You've got this place, which, you know, you mentioned you don't have any debt. So like mm -hmm. you probably own this. Yeah, right. I saw someone asking like, does that mean you paid off all your real estate mortgages? Well, again, I sold all my properties outside of this one. So like technically I paid them off, but not really the way most people oh, think of that, end. right? So, and out here. again, I don't think that, um, like I'm not saying that this was the financially optimal decision to make, um, but for me, based upon my personal value matrix, it was the optimal choice. And just anecdotally, having seen you over over the years, I would say you seem more at peace with yourself, happier, in a better mind space now than you were during the start of COVID, even before. I would say, would, you, I, would that be fair, or like? Do you feel better now I, being I, up here or there's no way it or? there's no way I don't appreciate when individuals say that. But I think like deep down, if I was to think about it and I know the studies already support this, most people have a baseline level of happiness and it honestly doesn't matter what circumstance you put them in. Once they adjust to that circumstance, they're going to find themselves falling back to that baseline level of happiness. So I think it's easy to project Hedonic adaptation. Yeah. So I think it's easy to project that like maybe I'm happier or maybe I'm less happy or whatever. For me, this is just like a different phase or season of life. So there's been lots of times where like I'm going, you know, balls to the wall, 100% out, trying to leave everything on the court. And then there's other times that I pull back extremely. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm actually going to like be very slow. And I think of the, uh, the Navy SEALs have the slogan, you know, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And so... I th in my mind, I move very slow until I know what I'm doing. And once I know what I'm doing, it's smooth. And then I can act very fast. And so, again, when I was, like, screwing around on YouTube, that was, you know, with hindsight, it feels like that was a period of moving fast. But it was actually, like, moving very slow. Where I was just like, let's see what happens on YouTube, right? Like, Mike, you want to talk with me every week on my YouTube channel. Okay, like, I'm going to, you know, reach out to this Graham Stephan guy. I'm going to interact with these different people. And there was a lot of experimenting and different dead ends that I took during that period of time that just like, you know, when people go back um, with the benefit of hindsight, like they overlook those things and they maybe either just see the high points or just the low points. Um, so yeah, I guess like TLDR, I think Bitcoin's the answer and it's the future. 
I personally think that that's going to continue to consume more and more of my time and energy. For those of you that have never looked into it, I strongly encourage you to spend some time. I think um, uh, uh, Safedean's um, The Bitcoin Standard, one of the best easy books to onboard yourself. I've given out over 40 or 50 copies of that book. There's another like 12 sitting here in the lodge. We literally have it in every single one of our cabins here. Um, you know, to me, it's the modern day. Like I used to talk about early retirement extreme was my Bible. And I've given out more than 100 copies of that book. This to me pairs very well with it. I think if you could take early retirement extreme and the Bitcoin standard and truly grok everything those books have to teach, um, you'll be much better off financially for it. So you're all in on Bitcoin then? It, it depends on your definition of all in, but like, uh, philosoph like, yeah, in a philosophical manner, I'm all in on Bitcoin. Um, you know, does that mean I'm 99% uh, resource or like investment allocated to it? No, I'm not at 99%, but certainly my intentions are to be above 50. Okay. So okay. I got like a 3% allocation, so I need to Obviously, well, increase again, that a bit. Like, I think it's very wise to get, as Bitcoiners talk about it, off zero. So literally, if you have no Bitcoin, like, just go throw 100 bucks at it. It's not going to make you rich or anything. But what happens is the moment you have skin in the game, you start paying attention to the game. And I think it's very wise for people right now to have some skin in that game so you start paying attention to it. Because, again, you're not going to go all in, or at least I hope you're not going to go all in on Bitcoin just because I talked to you about it, even if I've got an impressive beard. But my hopes are that you start paying attention to it. And during the next halving cycle, which will happen in early May of 2024, when you see the next bull run kick off, maybe then you'll start to take it more seriously. You'll probably buy at the top, you'll get burned, you'll get frustrated, you'll sell at the bottom like Mike did. But it'll all that's just Scrub. part of your Bitcoin journey. One of the sayings I love in the Bitcoin community is everyone gets Bitcoin at the price they deserve. And so right now, just understand if you're not investing any time or any money into understanding Bitcoin or into acquiring Bitcoin, you're going to get it at the price you deserve, but it's going to be a very high price and that's going to be a painful lesson. There might be just in like on market news, we've seen what's been happening with the SEC yeah. suing Binance, um, coming after Coinbase, coming after, you know, we're seeing what happened with XRP and Ripple and a few of the other mm -hmm. pending lawsuits. There's a whole bunch of litigation right now. And I think at first the government may reject it, but then that through litigation, they may end up regulating. And I think through regulation, that might lead to adoption. So it's possible yeah. this results in like potentially an opportunity to buy this fall the, as things kind of correct. And so like the one distinguishing factor I'll make there is like Bitcoin, in my opinion, separate from any of those other like uh, cryptocurrencies or products that you'd mentioned. Um, so I do think that we'll see regulators find some sort of compromise with a lot of the assets that are out there already in the crypto uh, sphere. However, I, I would encourage individuals not to become beholden to any centralized authority. So like, in my opinion, what you don't want to do is replace the fiat state currency with like Ethereum or something else that's been heavily pre-mined that has a big group of insiders that either have undue influence or complete control on that asset class. So I was actually like went down a, a rabbit hole. Someone DM'd me literally yesterday when I had some time to kill about Ripple and XRP. And a lot of people get triggered when I say like XRP and Ripple are centralized entities. And I oversimplify. I get it that you're going to argue that XRP technically is, you know, decentralized and yada, yada. There essentially was an 80% pre-mined, right? When they gave away 80% of the existing, uh, like the 80 billion coins to Ripple. Just like the point of the next financial system we have isn't just to recreate the shitty financial system we have now, but add the word crypto to it. The goal should really be true innovation. Right, the same way that, like in my opinion, internet was true innovation. It wasn't like we're gonna make the post office, but slightly better. We're like, no, we're starting all over. Like, we're so gonna start with in first. Fifteen principles. seconds or twenty seconds. Why? Why Bitcoin over the others? Yeah, because it's got a finite supply. Is that the big difference? So, like, it, it's truly decentralized, right? So that's right. an important aspect to understand. Um, it was the first, so there honestly is just a certain value in being first. But then finally, like, it it was built upon principles where everyone else that came afterwards was built upon trying to acquire profits, in my opinion. So like, literally, and I don't know how religious your community is, so this may trigger some people, but I'm okay with it. Satoshi, to me, is as powerful of a concept, like the concept of Bitcoin that Satoshi um, came up with, who was the founder of Bitcoin, who stayed anonymous throughout the entire period of time. Like, this to me is like the same sort of revolution we saw with Christianity. I don't think the world will be the same after because of Bitcoin. And I just, 
there's something truly special about the level of um, generosity that it would take for an individual to choose to leave the world in a better place than they found it and not want to take credit for it. I just like, again, literally think of your favorite charity, your favorite charitable person, Mother Teresa, it doesn't matter. Those people still like had a certain level of ego to them because they were front facing, right? Like they weren't completely behind the curtain where it appears that Satoshi truly was. And I, so if the person who invented Bitcoin ever comes out and says, Hey, like I invented it and could prove it and had a huge wallet full of it. Would that change things for you? Uh, it would be concerning because it would appear to be such a dramatic shift in the principles we saw. Again, it wouldn't change the code. It wouldn't change the underlying principles that Bitcoin was implemented with. Craig Wright, I don't want to get sued, but I think there's a strong argument that he's not Satoshi for those of you that have gone down that rabbit hole. Uh, maybe Hal Finney, but again, uh, we'll never know that in my opinion. But I guess like the reason Bitcoin's important if you don't care about any of this shit, the reason Bitcoin should still be important to you is it's the only one the SEC and the US governments came out saying it is a commodity. There's, it's not a centralized entity. It doesn't represent a business. That's not true of any other thing, right? The rest like, are all securities then potentially. Potentially. And that, that means that they're going to have to compromise with the government, right? If the government's going to try and control it like a security, it's either going to have to become an outlaw currency, right? It's going to have to only exist either in the black markets or outside US jurisdiction, or they're gonna to have to find some level of compromise with a, a centralized state actor. And, and they control the off-ramp and the on-ramp yeah. and everything with it. Exactly. Good points. So Bitcoin all the way. I need to, yeah. go, I need to go buy like 20 Bitcoins the next time it, it dips well, a bit. And again, like I'd much prefer people become educated than own Bitcoin, but if you're gonna to refuse to get educated, yeah, grab some Bitcoin, sit on it, try not panic when it goes up or down and uh, just ride it I do out. have a few uh, in Anahar Wallet. They're there like forever. Yeah. yeah they're my favorite and I definitely did. Obviously, living on a lake, boating accident. I've lost all my Bitcoin, but um, I actually I look lost forward the to Wallet too. I don't, I gotta, just, just finding them. Like, this stacks. actually happened. I had a friend who had like a lot of crypto, like back when ETH was cheap, had like hundreds sure. of ETH, and I actually lost the hard wallet and still is looking for it to this day. They've moved twice. And they're like, I think it's like <laughs> in a box and it's like one attic maybe. Like, Imagine you find that in such a payday. Like that would be. You could convert it all to Bitcoin, and then mm -hmm. you'd have a real store of value, right? Exactly. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, there's so many great comments here, guys. There's yeah, and I hundreds of you guys have been jumping guys. in. And there's just been so many. I can't even answer all of these. There's just so many great people. It's great to see a lot of you guys on here. Uh, I'm gonna try and cherry pick another nice um, softball to lobby up. Um, okay. What's Matt's take on Florida real estate? That could be an easy one for you. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, compared to other jurisdictions where you can invest in real estate, I think Florida is more favorable, right? I think that they're in general, you're going to find more like freedom or individualist oriented policies in Florida. So Very net true. positive on it at the same time, you know, Florida has been through a bit of a hype cycle recently. So like who knows in the short term, how that shakes out. Right. Uh, so there's, Obviously, when we're talking about real estate, several aspects to consider. One is like real estate's all about locale, right? So like Florida's location, actually a big location, state, location. right? So like, you know, are we talking about the panhandle? Or are we talking about the northern part? So just understand that whatever you're doing, like it still comes down to the devils and the details there. So don't just blindly invest in something because it's in a market that someone told you is good. Um, but in general, if I was to invest in the US, I would naturally be attracted to markets like Florida or Texas. I think a lot of the smarter Canadian real estate investors I see seem to be attracted to those markets as well. So presumably where there's smoke, there's fire in that case. But um, yeah, just do your due diligence like you would on any other investment. For me, just to speak where yeah. I feel on Florida, like I have been investing in Florida yep. and I do like Florida. And you know, my, my end game is still that triangle that I talk about, right? And this is like, this is me saying like, look, I know that I have a lot of family members who are like full blown communist socialists who love Canada and like, you know, they're all about like transforming Canada into a communist state where we have like UBI for everyone, which is mm -hmm. sorry, UBI is universal basic income for everyone. They're saying with the advent of AI and some of the changes coming and the new taxation and inflation, those are all good things so they can take from everyone else and mm -hmm. spread them around Redistribute. equally how they see fit. There are many plot holes with that. I find as a, as a, I'm somewhat capitalist, I'm pretty capitalist, I would say. So I find that's a bit troubling. But um, one of the things that has led me, I guess, to this is like, maybe I'm not in the, in the side of the majority. Maybe I'm in the minority and the, minor mm -hmm. like, the majority don't want to fend for themselves. They want it to be given to them. They want just to focus on things that are fun. I don't know. So that's part of like my cop-out answer. My easy answer was like, I love Canada in the summertime. And so I will always, like, I actually think 
being here has helped solidify one of the seeds I planted years ago to that triangle is adding another layer, which is resorts on top of each location. So having resorts, I think, in Ontario that I come and check out in the summer and then going to the Bahamas for my minimum 90 days to be a tax resident and live there and relocate to the Bahamas to be tax free and not be subject to any miscellaneous asset taxes or mm -hmm. bank freezes or capital gains um, taxes they decide to levy or any other crazy tax they decide to yeah. levy on me, right? I can bleed those profits out to my management company in the Bahamas and I have sovereign freedom over my wealth. If I'm distributed over multiple countries, I have that additional layer of freedom. And it's like having that extra passport, that extra place to go just gives me another layer of like, if I misspoke and like they decide to renounce my Canadian citizenship for whatever reason, <laughs> like I don't think it would ever come to that. But like after COVID, we saw some crazy things happen, some mm -hmm. crazy precedents that nothing's off the table, I think, where the government will push the bounds of what it can do. And so for me, that's why going back to Florida, to answer the sum of my question, I would say uh, Florida is a great place because of its proximity. I think from a weather perspective, it's just warm all the time. It's beautiful. It's nice. It's very right leaning. It's very free. Um, you know, they have put out now rules that for the next pandemics that come up, because there will inevitably be more pandemics, that they will not force any mandatory vaccinations. They're putting out legislation to stop that. Um, so their DeSantis is doing a lot of great work there, which I think is what draws a lot of us right wing, you know, capitalists and, and those who, who like freedom, right? But for me, the thing that really drew me to Florida was that I could drive there. It was really, really close, whereas mm -hmm. like Texas was super far. So proximity was super nice. Two, you can get really, really cheap stuff. Like you can go to Daytona Beach and buy hotels for like less than 100K a unit. You can buy houses on sale for like $150,000. Mm -hmm. And so that was like price was really good too, um, relative to what you can earn in income. So that was like the numbers just worked really, really well in Florida versus like California is a beautiful place, but they don't work at all there. And terrible policies. <laughs> and terrible policies too. Uh, and then the proximity to the Bahamas. So I could set up a, like they have whole communities with condo fees where mm -hmm. there's a flight um, landing strip and you each get a hangar in this in your condo fee in Florida. And it's a 15 minute chopper ride or helicopter, 60 miles is where you have to go. So that's like a little bit less than hundred kilometers you've got to go to get to uh, Grand Bahamas, like Freeport. Freeport has no property taxes. You're completely income tax free. Um, so you can have a, a nice little property there and pay no property tax to keep it, put some insurance on it against a hurricane, maybe have a staff there to take care of the resort and you can land in and like, you know, fly back and forth if you needed to. Mm -hmm. Monday to Thursday, if you wanted some amenities or some medical access or something, Miami has some of the best in the world for world-class healthcare that you can pay through the nose for, but you have options for that. So to answer your question about Florida, I like Florida, I'm bullish on Florida. Despite everything pulling back, Florida has re remained strong and not really dipped at all, it's been flat. So I like that about Florida. Supply demand imbalances in Florida currently are in support of, you know, long-term holding and long-term appreciation. They're not building near enough. Um, I mean, Florida isn't perfect, but. Um, yeah. yeah. And again, I'm not an expert on it, but I think if you look I'll at look even like question, the net migration numbers right on Florida, I think it's very positive. That needs to be a consideration. It also doesn't suffer from the same sort of like natural borders that Texas does. Right. So like, you know, Texas as a state, potentially if we continue to see like loose, um, national border policy in the United States, like will disproportionately be burdened, right? By uh, illegal immigration where again, Florida, like maybe you'll eventually see that with uh, Cuba or other sort of uh, um, illegal immigration. But right now I think it is uniquely situated to prosper. I just wanted to pick up this comment that uh, we both, since our last Mike and Matt on fire, we both look like rock stars from the eighties. They said, <laughs> so there's some, I'll take that. Some yeah. headbangers. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the hair's long right now. Yeah. Matt's hair is super long. Actually. It's even longer than mine. I think I've been growing it for like almost two years now. So you must be the mm -hmm. same thing since the yeah. pandemic. Yeah, pretty much. I was just like, fuck it. <laughs> um, this one says, Mr. Matt Kiever, I remember you were buying multifamily at one point. I don't know what the question is, but sort of like a comment. Yeah, that's, that's a true statement at one Here's point. Here's the rest of the question. Okay. Um, did you say you don't have any debt? Does that mean you pay off all your real estate? Okay, yeah, so. I think we hit that. You're basically, um, this is your only real estate investment currently, but you may yep. look to new real estate investments yep. if it makes but sense. It's not a high priority to me just because again, well, overall, and for the average person, it's probably a great investment um, to at least consider when it comes to you know cash flow and real estate. But for myself, I like if you go back and watch some of my early videos, I'll talk about like, this idea or concept of wanting to be water. And what's unique about Bruce water Lee is like, here. you can't grab onto it, right? Yeah, it's fluid. And be so like I think for, for the degrees of freedom that I'd like to prioritize and to be able to speak out um, 
in a maximal manner against things that I think are either wrong or in favor of and I think are right. I think having as few like seizable assets or even just like points of leverage that any sort of actor, particularly centralized actors like a state, uh, could have against me, I think is a net benefit. So again, that's what I think uh, positions Bitcoin in a very uniquely favorable light for myself and anyone else that considers themselves a uh, freedom maximalist. Um, there was a question here, and it's come up three times now from three different people. So I'm going to answer all three of your guys' questions at once about uh, rates and whether you should do like a long-term hold or variable or whatever thoughts on forecasts into the future. Um, I'll start, and then maybe sure. Matt can, can go that. after. Uh, my thought is, so what I'm doing currently with the last couple of mortgages I've got is I'm fixing in. I don't have a lot of faith in the current narrative that rates are going to come down by September of this year. So they said there's going to be a one and a half percent or like 1.5% drop in prime between now and Christmas. That's what's currently priced in. I think that's really optimistic. That's some aggressive rate cuts. And we just got a hike, by the way. So like you don't hike and then immediately next meeting start cutting aggressively. It would seem strange. That would seem like it doesn't make a lot of like sense. Like you don't so, know what you're doing. Right? That would look incompetent. <laughs> which maybe they don't. Maybe the market's pricing that in. So be that what it will. Um, if you believe that rates are going to come down, you would have to also believe that inflation is going to be coming back down to their target of 2% or that they're going to define inflation in some new way or you know so that it can appear to be at 2% to meet their target. If you believe that, um, then you should go variable right now because then obviously by January of, of 2024, you're going to be starting to be in a winning position because Prime's now around 7%. So if they're going to cut 1.5%, 2% between now and then, that's the bull case scenario. Uh, if you believe that, then you'd start to win. Fixed rates right now, you can get a five-year fixed for 4.99, you can get a three-year fixed. They've come down aggressively, actually, because the market's pricing in so many drops. Mm -hmm. I think that's an arbitrage opportunity, in my opinion. I think the bank's too optimistic. And so you can lock in a three-year or a five-year fixed around 5%. I think you'll probably be okay, because Prime's almost seven right now, right? So that's a 2% spread in your favor. If for the next year it takes them to start bringing rates down, you're ahead by 2%, eventually get to break even, then there'll be a year of potentially, you know, maybe where you're at a little bit of a loss locked in at 5%, maybe, in the bull case scenario. So I think in the bull case scenario, you end up with a situation where, um, you know, maybe it costs you a little bit less now, which is more cash now is better, I think, to invest in quality assets. Um, also, it allows you in the long term to hedge a bit of your, your risk. So for me, I've been fixing in. That said, I went into this with very bright mortgages, and I have millions in very bright mortgages as well that, you know, I'm paying the price on. It's thankful, or it's lucky, I guess, or I'm grateful that the properties I have cash flow well, and I have ample reserves. So it really doesn't affect me at all, one way or the other. It goes, my, I had variables at 1.24 that are now well over 5%. So that's a 400% increase in my interest payment on my on my mortgage. But like, again, that didn't affect me in a, in a great way. And I had choices to fix in along the way. I'm in it for the ride. I'm gonna let it you know, play out where it will. But I, I did fix in all my most recent mortgages just to take some risk off the table in case it's another 1970s era of stagflation where they're not able to get inflation all the way down. Maybe it, it bounces, maybe it's a little bit sticky. Uh, rates have to be higher for longer. So that's kind of my forecast. I would say if you're gonna be buying a property with a time horizon of like one year and you're gonna refinance it, maybe go variable because your penalties to break are gonna be not so bad. If you fix in now and you have to break in a year and a half after a renovation, they're gonna kill you on the interest rate differential. So when you go to break that, to put a new mortgage on it or you go to sell it or some reason you wanna break that mortgage uh, due to sale or refinance is typically two reasons. Uh, but there could be other reasons. Maybe you just want to pay the property off for whatever reason or some the world kind of collapses and your debt comes due. The interest rate differential, if rates do fall, is going to be significant when you're at a 5% mortgage and it goes down to three. Uh, they're not going to want you to pay back that mortgage. So they're going to nail you potentially on a year worth of interest. I've seen interest rate differential calculations. They start at three months, but they can get really aggressive in a declining interest rate environment, which we saw in 2009. I knew people that had $40,000, $50,000 breakout fees on $200,000 mortgages. So they took 25% of the entire mortgage balance as a hit. That's like a couple of years of interest in a hit up front. So when you fix in, a lot of mortgage brokers don't declare this, but like there is a different interest rate differential calculation and it's the higher of the two. It's not the lower of the two. Whereas with variable, you get three months interest penalty and that's it, you're out. So you pay three months worth of interest and you can refinance, you have lots of options. So take that in to your consideration when you're trying to fix in. I guess Matt will give his forecast as well. And we'll sure. Um, yeah, so in my opinion, the average real estate investor is probably better served to still choose uh, um, fixed rates versus variable. Um, again, there's edge case scenarios, as you kind of outlined, Mike, where like maybe your time horizon's very short, in which case it's probably going to naturally make a lot more sense to go variable. But the big question I'll put back to anyone that's like asking these questions about interest rates and whether to go fixed or variable, my biggest question to you is, as a real estate investor, 
You know, is your primary business speculating on the future of interest rates? Um, because if it is, then you probably should be playing this game and spending a lot of time and energy trying to figure out what's financially optimal when it comes to interest rates. But if that is the case, I would argue there's probably better asset classes versus mortgages for you to use as your hedge in order, or your speculation um, in order to make that sort of money, right? And if the answer is like, nope, in fact, I'm a real estate investor first and the interest rate, you know, skimming the best or like uh, position myself for the optimal interest rate, it's just, you know, uh, gravy or it's the icing. In that case, just go fixed and focus on the next deal after that versus, right? And if the only way your deal makes money or you can make more money by playing this interest rate speculation game versus investing in another property after the one we're currently talking about, again, it probably actually shows you that you shouldn't be in the real estate game, but you should be speculating on interest rates, right? And finding, you know, paper assets that will allow you to speculate at maximum leverage versus like becoming, you know, so obsessed with mortgages. And this is something that, you know, I shared back in the day when I first started my YouTube channel, the only times that the interest rates I negotiated felt like they mattered was on my first two properties. And it was because I didn't know any better. And so like, we were really proud to like get the lowest interest rate. I think one of ours was like, a variable at like, it was something crazy, honestly. It was like prime minus 0.75, which at the time was just wild. And like, we were like, you know, we're paying like 2.15% on this mortgage. And, you know, we thought we were geniuses. But honestly, the genius play was going and buying the next property. It wasn't like, you know, patting ourselves on the back about optimizing our interest rate choice in that moment for that one property. For me, I still got a high when I get a good rate, but that's just the frugal in me. I, I can't not. Well, you're the guy that gets a high when you go to like a all-inclusive buffet or your, you know, your hotel has so like free true. breakfast. So. It's so true. I'm a platinum member at the Marriott, <laughs> and I load up on the free, free dinners and the free breakfast when I stay at a Marriott that, that has full service. Um, you know, I, I agree. I actually, I actually agree with you. Now that I think about it, I think if your investment doesn't make sense, locking in for five years at five percent and you can't cash flow, what are you doing buying it? Um, mm -hmm. probably is the, again outside is the those edge case scenarios where it's like oh it's a flip it's yeah, a one a, year time right and if it's a flip but why like, are you going variable because yeah. you're going to be selling it so like again there, there there are a few if you're it's a long-term hold you should probably fix in is the simple answer i think and if yeah. you're worried about getting some of that upside if rates do fall and getting the fomo of like those low rates again uh, there are ways you can invest in bond yield etfs that you can get exposure to that will ride the waves going down and you could get exposure that way. So there are better ways, I think, to hedge than, mm -hmm. than that. And then if things don't go your way, you are fixed in, you have that protection, you're locked in for five years of 5%, which is in relative terms in the grand scheme of like the last 30 years, not that bad actually, 5% mortgages. In the grand scheme of like the history of humanity, yeah, like, like go look back at like biblical interest rates and it'd be like, give a person a cow, like lend a person a cow and the next year they want two cows. like. <laughs> Again, we've got wildly cheap debt in this ecosystem, even at our, you know, 22 year high, I think we're at right now in Canada in regards to where the Bank of Canada's interest rate is, it's still an anomaly on the grand scale of time. And like, just thinking about how the investments play out as rates, I know a lot of people are bullish right now. And I just want to make this comment because I saw it once pop up today. Uh, but where I thought prices of real estate are going, we've seen like between depending on which market you pick in southwestern Ontario, a 10 to 15% rip in the last four or five months, just like a really big rip up. Now that is coming off of a big trough, right? Like we had a lot of pain last year. And so some of that is rebounding. We're back to where we were almost the end of May, start of June last year. So almost like pre rate hike mm -hmm. levels. So we're getting closer to those levels. That to me feels like a bear market rally. And so my insight is that like seasonally we see a five to 10% pullback December, January every year. And then in May, there's typically a five to 10% rip up. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is that there's seasonality that helps you. So properties look nice, they're landscape mm -hmm. nice. Uh, typically families don't want to move during Christmas. They want to move at the end of a school year. So they'll buy something in May with the closing during the summer. They'll transition if they're in a new school district so their kids can be comfortable. Just We just know that the best time to sell a property is in the spring. Best time to buy typically is in the fall or the winter. That said, there can be deals all year round and like certain investment properties don't follow any thesis at all around like all of that uh, jargon. But I think we're gonna have a little bit more pullback. This surprise, like you said, one in, I didn't know one in five economists were expecting this rate hike. Yeah, I thought so, it was so higher. that means like, four and five weren't. Wow, like, yeah. I thought there's a 90, to me, if you had asked me this like a week ago, 90% probability they're raising rates. When I saw the inflation data came out last month, I was like, how is any economist looking at the same inflation data I am and not? Yeah, it like, like it's so hard because like one, if you trust the Bank of Canada, you clearly don't listen to the Bank of Canada or never have before. 
Um, but I agree with you, particularly after Australia did kind of their surprise rate hike, it made a lot more sense that Canada would uh, follow. Well, they uh, even, they even hinted, like, we're thinking about raising rates. Yeah. And it was like, okay, but they're thinking about it's it. Just, it's like, it's so hard because, like, again, we've heard other things from them, true, particularly true. over the bad last three record. years. Yeah, and I really do think they've got a bad track record. And, again, that's where, you know, if if you get, like, if this is your version of fancy football, tracking interest rates, cool. Like, have fun with it. Enjoy the uh, experience. But, like, as a real estate investor, don't drive yourself crazy over these, like, 25 basis points or not because again if that's making or breaking your business model you probably have much bigger things to be worried about than that 25 basis points if you're going to sell this property five years from now 10 years from now or it's a long-term hold it doesn't really matter what the rates are doing in the next quarter and the quarter after that and the month after that and the meeting after that what really matters is like long-term fundamentals and if this property mm -hmm. can cash flow at the current rates that's what's important being able to self-service itself put some money in your pocket don't buy this property saying hey rates are going to come down then it will cash flow yeah that's speculating right so that's dangerous um, I also wouldn't pay top dollar right now or market value for properties unless I really had emotional reason that I needed to buy that property. I'd be buying at a 20% discount because we may pull back. This 15% rally we just had, well, all of a sudden the Fed just dropped the hammer and they may drop the hammer again. That's going to cool things off into the already slow season of fall winter. There may be some really good opportunities to buy. So if you have some gunpowder, don't feel like you need to deploy all of it right now because I know a lot of people are getting caught up in these realtor hype videos that they're watching. We're like, I'm going to miss out. And they got the fear of missing out, the FOMO. Don't let FOMO lead you into making bad investment decisions. So the people watching this, don't let FOMO force you and your realtor who's telling you you have to buy right now, you're missing out, it's going to the moon. I don't think it's going to rip up anytime soon in a substantial, meaningful way going into this winter. I think if anything, flat or down is the more likely scenario um, going into this next 12 months of uh, pain, really, especially in the commercial space because there are a lot of really bad factors pushing for office mm -hmm. and retail right now and commercial space. A lot of those mortgage notes are coming due and they were fixed in at 3% and now they're coming due and commercial is like prime plus one a lot of the time. So a lot of these smaller commercial buildings are looking at like an 8% renewal, which is seven prime seven, right? Seven plus one now at 8% in Toronto, Vancouver, you know, Calgary, they may have a cap rate of like five at best. And that made sense when you yeah. borrowed at three, but when you borrow at eight and you fix it in for another five years at eight, that's a lot of pain when you have to lock that in. So there is a bunch of pain coming in the commercial space potentially and some negative factors. So yeah. And I, I don't think it can too. be, um, in my opinion, overstated at this point in time, but like the pressures on <laughs> the demand side of things, I think would be a major concern of mine in the commercial real estate as well. Again, if you're super niched, if you know your niche, cool, awesome. But if yeah. you're just generically looking to get involved in commercial real estate right now, I would tread very lightly. I think that we haven't seen the end of the idea of uh, telecommuting, right? I think we're going to see more and more pressure on that. More I think that, yeah. more and more businesses are going to be looking to tighten their belt, right? Whether we're going into, you know, uh, a recession or a stagflation uh, scenario, as you kind of highlighted earlier, Mike, um, those are all negative pressures on commercial real estate. And uh, again, there's opportunities in every niche. You're just going to have to you know, put in the time and effort, right? Nothing's easy. Uh, nothing's just going to be given to you for free in this sort of uh, environment. The, a lot of the speculators that message me are like, I see this message a lot. It's like, hey, Mike, um, we all believe rates are coming down. And so they are coming down next year because we believe it to be true and this, this, and this, and there's no negative catalyst possible. And like the best case scenario, therefore, shouldn't I buy now and then unload the property when rates are low and everyone can afford to finance up to the tits at these low rates. And it's like, that's a very dangerous line of thinking. So if you're watching this, maybe give your head a little shake and rethink through some of the bear case scenarios where this yeah. might not play out how you like, think it will. Approach this in like a blue team, red team scenario, right? If you can't make a strong devil's advocate against your current investment philosophy, you probably haven't thought long and hard enough about it, right? Like I can talk myself both into and out of almost any investment because any investment I'm familiar with because, uh, you know, I understand where the detractors are, right? And like what their main points are. And ideally as an investor, you'll find solutions to overcome those things, but you shouldn't be naive or ignorant to those um, challenges that someone could make to your investment philosophy. And like you were just kind of talking about some of the more aggressive investment strategies you've heard. Like one person was DMing me the other day about, uh, you know, they were speculating on raw commercial land. I was just like, oh God, that sounds so scary to me in this environment. Like, again, no interest flow. rates are high, right? Um, no governments are making it easier to build these days, right? It's always they're adding more and more red tape. And then you add in, in general, I think lesser demand and likely 
uh, over the next decade at least, and I don't see what would be the catalyst for significant increases in demand of like uh, of physical commercial real estate. Um, what would Matt McKeever's strategy be if he had to buy in Toronto? Oh, that's easy. Don't. <laughs> don't. That was I, mine like, too. Yeah. Again, like, you, you just don't. Honestly, that's that would be my. It's approach. getting really easy to virtually manage a portfolio now too. Like every contractor I know has FaceTime or like the ability to do like a WhatsApp video call. So it's really hard for them to screw you in the ways that they could have five, ten years ago. Or like, oh, I sent you a weird angle you can, picture yeah. of the bathroom. Like, you can build much better systems. And again, better like, systems, e better even management, technologies. Right? Like, um, uh, fuck, what's the one? Like it's. Not Gopher or something, but like it's uh, like Task Rabbit. You could literally hire someone off a of Task Rabbit to like go do the walkthrough if you yeah. didn't trust the contractor, if you wanted to check and back um, to what they're telling you. So again, there's lots of workarounds. So this idea that like you know when someone's like, "How would you invest in Toronto?" Like one, you clearly just don't know my investment philosophy, right? Because and I'm like I'm not throwing shade here, but like I wouldn't because it doesn't meet the fundamentals that would be attractive to me. Um, to try and like create a cash flowing rental property. It just, that doesn't exist in Toronto. And uh, you know, not all markets are gonna work with every single strategy. So again, you either need to decide like, what's the strategy or what's the market? But if you're gonna be, you know, beholden to the Toronto real estate market, um, just understand cash flow is not gonna be uh, in, in the cards. I'm actually really bullish on surrounding city, rural areas around cities. Cause I think people are going to move out of the main city, because the main draw of having the city was like, you had to be close to work. And now mm -hmm. everyone works from home, we're in a virtual reality, you can run your business pretty much anywhere. You could have your clients in Toronto and probably still have a staff and manage them remotely in most cases. People prefer that. And so there's a lot of, I think a lot of arguments that could be made to like a decentralization of people moving away from big cities, for which sure. is sort of an interesting change because you could buy, you can still find the odd house outside of London area for like $200,000 that's like more rural. Mm -hmm. go within an hour radius around London or even Toronto, a couple hundred thousand dollars, you, you draw a big enough circle around Toronto, you can buy houses for 200,000. The same house in Toronto is like 1.2 million. So is it worth 600% more when it rents for maybe twice as much? I don't know. Like as things shift, maybe there's less de desire for the well, downtown core. Naturally, like more densely urban environments usually come with higher regulation. And that's and that honestly too. a barrier, right? Yeah, it's so, a huge hurdle to overcome. Um, again, there's- Permits, regulation, yeah, rental multiple licenses. Factors, just NIMBYs, right? Like yeah, all sorts of things. Yeah, not my backyard, neighbors calling on you. It's a pain in the ass. You don't get that in rural at all. Yeah, and again, like there's trade-offs there. So like I wouldn't be racing to a hamlet with 80 people and wanting to buy a rental property there without you know fundamentally understanding like, can someone choose to be like a, um, a telecommuter, is there enough demand? Like, why would a telecommuter choose this hamlet or another hamlet? Like, is there enough property tax to support the infrastructure for the mm -hmm. hydro and the, the sewer? Because some small hamlets, they actually just go bankrupt and they can't support the sewer anymore. And so the cities get abandoned. So just, there is again, risk I think that's probably far more common in the States, um, that sort of scenario. But yeah, just understand the risks and rewards. But uh, I, I would caution anyone that's, you know, if you're a fan of my or Mike's investment philosophy, just understand like, you know, how much real estate over the course of your investment career have you owned Mike in Toronto or Vancouver? My answer is zero. No. I've owned not a single property in either of those markets. And yet, you know, I've had over a hundred units. I don't, you've definitely had over a hundred units. I'm sure All over, yeah. different points in time. Hundreds. And so like, again, with both of those sort of perspectives, just understand that like, yeah, we're not, um, we're not trying to like, square peg that round hole no square peg in the round holes guys <laughs> um okay someone asked how much to shave your beard uh world peace you that's got a, it that's a pretty high cost there's no monetary <laughs> amount that you would take to shave your beard clean what do i like yeah hit me up in the dms shoot me a bitcoin and uh I'll i was gonna it. say like, if you gave me like a couple of eth i feel like he might you know convert. no not for ETH. not for ETH. No, okay no it would have to be a bitcoin but what do I have honestly bitcoin? like I probably will shave it, not like there's a, a high probability it even gets shaved this year, but it's just going to be because I get sick of the heat. He might do it for free, but he's going to, he's going to yeah. take the Bitcoin. But uh, yeah, Bitcoin and you got yourself a deal. Uh, have people forgotten how much realtors push in 2022? There were a lot of realtors pushing in that, that heat. It's true. Yeah. The fear of missing out. Um, Blake, how you doing? Shout out. Mike and Matt are back at it again. Shout out to the original London boys. Mm -hmm. Shout out Blake. Um, Alberta. Um, curious your thoughts on Alberta because they've got some really great legislation lately that's been coming down the pipeline. It's better than what Ontario is doing. For yeah, I, I tax think that rates, you can probably you know, yeah freedom. 
I, I think that in general, Alberta has opportunities. Um, again, I think every single Canadian province does. With Alberta, understand that naturally it's more prone to a boom bust cycle. So again, a lot of that's commodity price driven, right? Commodity Oil. driven economy. Yeah. Um, so understand that, particularly if you're going to be going into those more rural markets, like just look at the history, right? So uh, a friend of mine, he's in the process of trying to buy his first uh, real estate investment. And it's like actually a big apartment building in Alberta. And my advice to him was like, the fundamentals are still the same. Obviously, understand if you're going to remotely uh, manage this, like you're going to need to like take it very seriously, right? Build the proper systems and processes. Don't like, you can honestly like cut corners when you're self-managing, when you live down the block from the property. I'm not saying it's wise, but you can get away with that shit. We've all done that. But like, you can't when it's virtual, right? So like when you're several provinces away, again, maybe you're from Alberta and that's where you're looking to invest, but just going to that eyes wide open, I personally would want to try and like stress test my portfolio in Alberta for, you know, over the last 20 years, what was the worst case scenario? And understand one of the things that we've become very comfortable with here in Ontario is rent prices only go up. And like, it would almost seem like, you know, antithetical, like it would just be unthinkable for an Ontario landlord to think that your rent prices could go down 20%. Like That's when you go to though, rent. We, we've had yeah, situations it, where there's like 20% vacancy. You can't even fill a building. Yeah. And so like understand that. And again, just look at the last 20 years. It's actually pretty good in Alberta. I think there's better publicly available data. So you don't even have to just depend upon um, Stats Canada for a lot of like your uh, um, vacancy rates and stuff like that. A lot of the local municipalities and townships share that data. I forget the name, but there's an Alberta oriented website you can check out there as well. So I uh, definitely encourage you to go look at that, but there, there's opportunity there. Shout out to Aiden for the $2 super chat. Really appreciate it. Uh, all the way from Australia. Nice. I remember Aiden. I remember he came Aiden. to yeah. the, to the to uh, Vegas, Vegas right? event. Yeah, yeah, the mastermind. So how you doing, Aiden? Hope everything's going well with you and the, and the Navy there. And I was going to say, yeah, I remembered him being the Navy guy. Yeah, yeah he, cool. uh, yeah, I guess he just got a shock too because Australia just raised their interest yep. rates again, their prime again as well. So they're right in it with us. Mm -hmm. So hi from Canada. <laughs> uh, okay, a lot of people saying hi. Good to see us on. Let me pick another question here. Um, we did rate hack predictions. We did that question. Do you keep your money? This is an easy one. Do you keep it in a wallet or on an exchange? I think they mean a hard wallet. Yeah. So like this I is would like a free yeah, lobby. strongly encourage you guys uh, cold storage, right? When it comes to uh, any of your cryptocurrency, particularly Bitcoin, um, there's lots of great products. So if you're Canadian, there's a fantastic Canadian company called CoinKite. Um, they make, uh, it's called the MK4, the cold card. Um, it's a fantastic product. It's probably more robust a solution than the average like beginner investor needs. But if you want to like have the Cadillac of, uh, uh, cold storage, I'd recommend that. Uh, there's other solutions like Ledger or Trezor. Um, and if you want to go super simple, like let's say you're looking just to give like $100 in Bitcoin to your niece or nephew or your sister um, or brother or whoever. Uh, Open Dime is made by CoinKite as well. It's essentially like a bearer instrument. So it's just a tiny little USB key. Um, I usually keep it in here where I stream so I can show people, but essentially like little USB key. And uh, if you hold it, you've got the Bitcoin. So again, if you lose that, someone else has your Bitcoin or you've lost it forever. So just understand the risks um, you're taking on whenever you're deciding to self-custody Bitcoin, but understand the whole purpose of Bitcoin, in my opinion, at least, is to self-custody, is to try and cut out financial uh, intermediaries, right? Cut out the middleman. And the first middleman you should cut out is custodians. Yeah, you wanna have control if it's not your keys, not your crypto, yeah. that's the saying in the space. So if you have it on an exchange, it can be frozen, it can be taken, it can be seized. And we literally saw that down. here in Canada, right? Bezel. So like we literally saw in Canada bank accounts being frozen. We saw the Canadian government trying to go after and stop um, protesters giving the truckers Bitcoin. And they couldn't because like it, they were able to free some of it that was in donation wallets that were on uh, exchanges, if I remember correctly. But the physical Bitcoin that were being handed out either in paper wallets or open times, like the government literally couldn't stop it because they don't control it. Right. And it's not that like the government directly controls your bank. It's that the, they control the bank's charter. Right. They control whether the bank gets to operate. And that's why we saw banks go out of their way here during the Freedom Convoy protests in Canada to freeze bank accounts. They were actually extremely proactive. If you look into it, it's uh, dependent upon your uh, disposition, v either very unfortunate or absolutely disgusting what the Canadian banks chose to do. And uh, I think that we'll unfortunately see more and more financial censorship in the future. It's 
a higher probability, not a lower probability it happens. Especially the as they phase out cash, which is like, I think is a horrible yeah. idea. Yeah. And you can look towards like the Scandinavian countries, right? If you want to see where they're essentially making cashless societies right now in Europe, like it's actually wild. I don't know if you've seen some of this monetary policy, Mike, but I think that like, it, it depends upon the individual um, country in Europe. But I want to say it's like Spain. It's like a thousand euros. Any you, you can't like use cash for a purchase over a thousand euros. Oh what? Like you literally, it's illegal. Oh, it's, it's not horrible. even like. Yeah. That's it, some W E F yeah, kind of shit. It's some very scary. Some uh, World Economic Forum kind of world changing policy mm -hmm. changes. That's scary. And it's always done for our benefit. It's always it just our benefit. Doesn't feel yeah. like it, right? Um, I, feel I what, beat I you because I love you. Like, How do you not understand? Yeah, that? right. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to keep you on the right course, where I think you should be. Uh, there's a good question. I lost it now because when you guys type down below, it, it comes down below and then I have to scroll all the way back up again. But um, all of you guys, like there's been dozens and dozens of really awesome comments. I'm reading all of them. Um, I appreciate all of them. Like some of them saying that I've blocked up. I have been working out. Thank you for that. The dynamic duo is back. Uh, Rebecca Lynn Matheson says, hey, Mike and Matt. Hey, how's it going? Um, shout out to you as well. Isaac says you guys are on fire tonight. We did have hundreds of people, I think, that tuned in. And so That's awesome. only 60, 63 likes, 62 likes right now. Uh, we should have 100 right now. So please click that like button right now. Let's see it uh, Let's see it pop up. Do that little favor for me and click that little like button right there. I'll tell the algorithm that there's some value here. Uh, after reading The Creature from Jackal Island on the creation of the Federal Reserve, understanding the history of the creation of the world's government, banks the fiat currency system is broken nathan says that was yeah. no question but a comment no that's a great book i highly recommend individuals that haven't uh read it there's a great audiobook version of the creature from jekyll island and uh essentially just shows how um a small set of insiders or influential individuals were incentivized and chose to essentially manipulate our financial infrastructure and institutions and uh it all dates back well before 1971 but 1971 was the coup d'etat it was like the the cherry they were completely in control from that moment forward and uh again it's unfortunate because it's just honest ignorance on all of our parts like the school system doesn't teach you this it's not easy to self-learn this stuff it's complicated it's confusing um there's lots of smoke and mirrors right i i don't think we've ever talked about it, mike but i don't know if you spent much time like studying mmt modern monetary theory but this idea that like taxing taxes are really just a form of like uh controlling demand is what they argue and that it's not like about revenue and like essentially like you know when you hear like trudeau say things like uh budgets balance themselves or deficits don't matter that's honest like <laughs> while we might want just like lol at it like understand that there's actually like there's economic theories underlying that that i i think are misguided or wrong or evil um <clears throat> depending upon the intentions of the person that originally uh you know uh support or push these policies but it it's very easy for it's very easy for nefarious actors to control you if you don't understand the rules of the game and unfortunately when it comes to money none of us are given a handbook right and so what ends up happening is a lot of good intentioned individuals are like is it not enough that i go to work i work hard you know i'm trying to get promoted like i raise my family or i'm doing this or i'm helping my parents whatever the case may be and you know you're like do i really need to then listen to like creature from jackal island is probably a 10 or 20 hour audiobook, you know, I'd recommend probably at least 100 hours worth of studying on um, fiat currencies and Bitcoin and things like that. And I get that that's a big commitment. But if you really want to be financially sovereign, if you want to be in control of your financial destiny, it's it's not enough, sadly, in our current uh, economic client, um, climate and with our financial policies that Western democracies have implemented. Um, you, you can't just count on saving money, right? Like if you're putting your money under your mattress, you know, we all know that you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, yes. And the only way you're going to do that, like the only way you're going to come to understand that truly is through self-education. The truth is the more you look into how things are, have been created and how they're currently operating, the more you realize the conclusion, I think that both Matt and myself have come to, and that's that like, you can't rely on the government or the system to benefit for you. Yeah. They're really there to benefit for themselves. And so you need to be looking out. And it, again, stems back to what we talked about with early retirement and financial independence and like what this channel started to be about in six years ago, right? It was like that idea that you need to look at finding a way to break out of this matrix that you're in. And the way to do that, I think, is by first getting your money house in order. And so starting to figure out how to save for the future mm -hmm. and starting to manage your resources so that you have some yeah. for the future. Get yourself to a surplus. Getting to this question right here. Sorry, I just lost it. I had it all saved and marked and then... 
bunch of people commented and I lost it. I'm gonna find it and then we're gonna do it right here because it was a perfect segue. I was segueing into reading that question and then, you know, here we go. But around the idea of like, what do you do, right? And I think part of it comes back to, I'm not gonna be able to find it now, watch this. Of course, I'm not gonna be able to find it. Anyway, the idea was that like, I'll have to scroll forever to find that question, but the question was basically talking about like, why not just escape from the system? Is that not a, a logical conclusion to come to? Is like just escape from the current fiat system and maybe even escape from one jurisdiction and have multiple jurisdictions and multiple passports. And so I think that's the conclusion a lot of us have come to as we unlock financial independence is like, we either find yeah. a way to work within the system that it will work for us with our degrees of freedom, or we use our resources to find additional ways to like, Matt bought a small town. And I think like, maybe I'm overstepping here, but like low key, or, or at least originally you were wanting to create your own little town where like people would come and we well, like, have a retreat. And yeah, like, I, I used to make a joke that like eventually the ultimate goal was to have my own country. And like, that's just a, a really easy way to oversimplify my personal philosophy, but you can literally go back to like 2016, 2017 we can still videos. Make that though. Like not, no, like, that's still my general that's still intention. Doable, right? it's, like, it's what drew me to NFTs was this idea of like um, blockchain oriented memberships um, and using a decentralized ledger in order to um, show like proof of access, right? And anyways, I won't go down that rabbit hole, but absolutely I agree with you, Mike, that it comes down to like putting your financial house in order, trying to get to um, financial uh, sovereignty. But I think the big thing there is just a lot of people think if they get to a million dollars in the bank or they get to a real estate portfolio that cash flows is X amount. Again, those are all fantastic um, goals, but I don't think that they're the end destination. I think that if you really want to be sovereign, it is going to take, you know, investments or assets like Bitcoin that can't be um, can't be frozen, can't be stolen. You can't even be physically forced to hand it over, right? Like if you choose to not give someone the password to your Bitcoin, like that's it. They can't like, it doesn't matter how big a computer they got. They're not getting through that SHA-256, um, at least without a quantum computer or something crazy like that. Someday maybe. And, and we'll go down that rabbit hole someday maybe and explain all the like worst case scenario Bitcoin uh, FUD that you'll hear. But I think that, you know, yeah, I'll save the Bitcoin rant for a future date, but just understand that like there's levels to this game, like there is anything. So again, like step one, get to a surplus, right? Get to the point where you're making more money than you're spending. Then eventually like maximize that surplus, right? Ideally get your spend rate down to, you know, in my opinion, like 20% or at least 50% or less uh, of your income because that's when you're really gonna be able to significantly save and accumulate assets. Then use that towards like other productive means, right? Whether it's real estate investments, whether it's starting a business, um, <laughs> yeah, what's the password to my Bitcoin? Give me a few more, nice try, few more drinks. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, essentially just like uh, understand there's levels to it. And so don't become complacent, right? Like just because you get to a certain level, you can probably add more degrees of freedom to your current situation through education. So I think suffice to say, if you can get a little bit of a freedom buffer started, or even if you can't, if you're just getting started, I think both Matt and I are aligning towards creating our own little community, our yeah. own little financial independence community. And, and like, I go as far as to say is I, I want to plant flags. Like I want resorts in Canada. I want them in Bahamas. I want them at least one in South America, maybe Costa Rica, uh, somewhere well, yeah. in South America. I want one in Florida. I want to have multiple resorts and you guys are going to have an opportunity to join into that at some point. So like if you're interested in this at all, stay tuned because I think I may partner up with Matt and other people along the way that will come together and we'll create our own community of like-minded people because at the end of the day, beyond just having like, you know, our, our Bitcoin that can't be seized, if you have a group of people, mm -hmm. you collectively have power. Well, and, and like, like, let's just even use some antidotes during COVID, right? Like how many Amish communities were fucked with by the government? It, they weren't. The government was like, it's not worth the headache. Like there's easier fish to fry. Um, same with certain like Muslim communities and things of that nature. And I think that there's just shows- Protection in the yeah, community. Th there's deep bonds and relationships there. And I think that that's something that all of us should aspire uh, further towards, right? Like wanting to seek that out. It's a form of wealth or capital that is easy to overlook if you're only thinking about money. But again, like relationships, right? The concept that your network is your net worth, um, all those different things. Your social connectedness is actually more important in the real world and how we live our life day to day. I would much rather than have $100 million in the bank, I'd much rather have a really tight group of people that I can rely on, mm -hmm. whom I can be there for when they really need me and whom I can rely on when I really need them. And that social connectedness, those bonds will prove to have a more fruitful life. And just in general, you have much more strength against, you know, whatever 
you know, whatever enemy you face or whatever challenge arises or whatever comes up. And then I think having that where maybe that community owned places in multiple countries, now you've got the power of multiple passports. So they can't even, you know, say, hey, we're going to revoke your citizenship. It's like, okay, I'm going to leave then. You're going to lock us all down or whatever. We're going to, our community will leave and we have strength together. One person can be, can be squashed, but you know, when that foot comes down, there's a hundred people to catch the foot. It's a lot easier to support that, right? It's, they're less likely to try to take something mm -hmm. that's a hard squish. It's much easier just to squish one person. So and then, strength in numbers. Strength one in last community. thing I'll just say on that is, you know, literally the name of this property, right? I called it the Citadel. And so for those of you that aren't maybe familiar with the origin of that term, right? Like it dates back to um, old city centers. And um, I think like it was popularized during like Greek city centers um, and that Roman and all that. But essentially it's the idea of it's like the inner fortress. Right. So like it was the, you know, think about uh, in King's Landing, right. Um, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones when, like, right there. When the Cersei and them, like they retreat back into the inner fortress, um, which is the Citadel. And so like that's to me, like this is my safe haven. Right. And it's a safe haven. I wanted not just to create for myself, but for like my personal and local community. It's a safe haven for like, again, not that shit will ever hit the fan. But if I ever did, like those that I care about could find safety here within my little borders. Right. Of my Citadel. And that name is actually very meaningful to me because what is the full name of the resort. So I wanted to look up how to find it and yeah, kind of stay just here and check it out. Literally Google the Citadel. I think if you go to um, the Citadel the, private resort, the Citadel resort.ca, that'll um, yeah, be the website or whatever. But yeah, just Google the Citadel. You'll find it. It's in Canada. It's in Northern um, Ontario. We've got an Instagram account and all that uh, jazz. But Nestor Falls. Again, yeah, Nestor Falls near Kenora, Ontario. But I encourage. Everyone like seek out like-minded individuals, right? And again, it's something that I love about this area. There's so many people like homeschooling, unschooling, pod learning with their children. There's so many people that are doing uh, like homesteading that grow all their own food or grow 80% of their food. You know, they raise their own animals. They slaughter their own animals. Um, that to me is just like, there's a level of connection there that I think a lot of us lost in these like dense urban centers. And I think that there's a lot of... Uh, I think that there's a lot of uh, um, opportunity to take the best of urban centers and um, the density there through the internet and the best of like nature and, you know, actually being grounded. And that's what I'm trying to do here with the Citadel. I encourage those of you that this resonates with, you know, check us out, go build your own shit, right? There's lots of other interesting individuals, whether it's what like Tim Poole's doing in Western Virginia, whether you look towards what Owen Benjamin's doing, right, in Idaho. Um, whether it's like Tucker Max, what he's doing in Texas, there's a lot of fascinating characters out there that there's something in the air, right? There's something in the collective consciousness where I think we all know that there's a form of, um, there's a form of living, there's a form of cohabitating or living in like small communities, getting back to those tribes, right? A lot of us are familiar with the general concept that it's hard to have more than like 150 social connections, right? And that's where like the term tribe and like even one of the arguments towards human evolution, why we seem to max out of that until we started into agriculture and building like small uh, city states and things of that nature. And so I think that, I hope that the future actually is wildly bright, that it involves lots of individuals building their own communities, building their citadels, right? Starting their own countries, whatever that happens to be. And all that lies in a future that's decentralized. I am 100% on board with this idea. It's It stems back to what I talked about about 10 shows ago with this idea that like, and I sometimes talk about this where I, I feel like I've had enough of the push and the race and I feel like I need that social connectedness in some ways and I have that with my family and like we are also homeschooling my three kids and like so I'm I'm drinking from the from that hose mm -hmm. so to speak uh, so maybe that's why this resonates so well with me when I'm here I maybe someone from the city comes here and is like whoa this is so weird but I feel like in the city you have that that great you know connectedness with maybe your favorite 20 or 30 or 50 or 150 people then you have a whole bunch of people that are not great. Well, look, and you don't have yeah. that here. You have I only the great people. I naturally think of like how many people live in a subdivision and maybe you've got a beautiful house and a beautiful neighborhood, but like, do you know all your neighbors? And like, are you going to know them for the next decade, for the next couple no. of decades, right? Like, so, and like, don't get me wrong. I've lived in those like McMansions in the nice suburb, but like, we never got to know our neighbors and like none of the neighbors got to know each other. Right. And like, you kind of live this, like, it feels like a, a photocopy, photocopy of a photocopy of an existence versus like the authentic thing. So who watching us right now wants to come join and live in the Freedom Collective, I guess well, is what I've been calling it for like the last year or something. The Freedom Collective is an idea of people that all want that same mindset and like 
there must be some way to invest in this where maybe it's a corporation that owns these properties and everyone can own a piece of it, you know? And I feel like there's something there where like there's a council of people yeah. well, and a connectedness and there. And just that, to jump in on that, like uh, I'm not endorsing this organization, but if you guys want to look into it, it's something probably you should look into as well, Mike. Yeah, I'll look into it. I believe it's called Freedom Ranch. And essentially what they've done is bought a bunch of properties across the US. I think they've got like oh, six cool. or 10 of them. They're kind of like this. They're a little bit more prepper oriented and like shit hits the fan stuff. But I think there's a version of that that could look very interesting. They essentially like launched their own like crypto token to be their own like hmm. kind of currency and stuff like that. I don't think that they've got a perfect execution, but if you're looking for additional inspiration, yeah, it's again, cool place I'd recommend you check it out. I want to do something like that. I think it'd be really cool mm -hmm. to have like, I just want some resorts in like near London, Ontario, ideally within like two hours. If anyone, by the way, if you're watching this and you're like a realtor or a wholesaler, because I have lots of wholesalers that'll watch this replay and you know of an opportunity within two hours of London on either of the lakes, ideally Lake Huron, so north of London would be ideal for me of any type of resort that's like five, 10, 15 cabins, 25, a camping site, um, send them my way. If you want to partner on it, I might be interested in that too. Um, if you want to run a resort like that, hit me up. If you're like, hey, I would move to two hours north of London, Ontario, and I would live there and I would run it. Uh, that would be like super awesome. Even if you don't have the money, I will back you. If you are the, a hardworking individual and you can prove yourself, there there's, might be something there. So reach out to me because I'm interested in that. Um, if you like Florida, same thing. Bahamas, same thing. The next three years in my plan, I'd like to bring in resorts in all those areas. So if you want to be part of that, either as just joining the Freedom Collective, um, hit me up. That's been something I've been, it's a seed that I planted a while ago and, and being mm -hmm. here today and yesterday has solidified in my mind how great this experience is and I, I want that, that community. And so I see what Matt has here and I'm like, wow, this is a slice of paradise. It, it makes sense. It financially yeah, makes again, sense. It's, it's optimal. To me, there's no sacrifices yeah, here, right? Like, he has Starlink internet. And what more? I honestly spend majority of my time connecting <laughs> yeah. people through the internet. Same. So if I have fast Starlink quality gigabit speeds, which are better, by the way, than I have in the city right now, <laughs> on Rogers and Bell, and I have both because I'm worried one will go down. Um, this internet's been fine so far. So like, I will say that like, rural living potentially is a huge upside for people that they're mm -hmm. overlooking, right? Just because they yeah. don't think that they didn't realize that there was fast internet out here. They didn't realize that. Well, and again, a lot of this wasn't possible 10 years ago, right? So it like, there's yeah. no way we could have done a YouTube live here um, 10 years ago. No, in fact, like, there was no internet here until, at all. Yeah, until I got here, there wasn't internet, right? People were just using their data. Um, so again, you need to like keep up and understand where technology is headed, but I think it's really uh, leveled the playing field when it comes to the rural versus urban debate. I think we're gonna wrap up pretty soon here, but we had like hundreds of people come in. We had 75 likes. Let's get to 100 likes. I hope by the replay we're at 300 likes. I'd like to get that. If we get 300 likes, then uh, that would be super awesome. I'd really yeah. love that. I might and even bring Matt on again. The, the next time you're here, Mike, I was gonna say we should have like a, our chicken coop up and running so you can check out the chickens and that's all that. That's super awesome. Go get eggs fresh in the morning. Uh, that's awesome, by the way. That's super cool. Uh, there's something he, to that uh, about tax residency. Yeah, so free faster to kind of, I was, I, that was the triangle I was talking about. So if you weren't already following, I've shared this a million times, but I'll share it again. So uh, 90 days in the Bahamas is the minimum you need to maintain your residency. You're allowed to spend as many days as you want outside of that, outside of the country, and you are a tax resident of the Bahamas primarily. You have to buy a house in the Bahamas, so you have to make a, an investment into the Bahamas. It's about $750,000, though there are joint venture partnership opportunities where potentially you can get in for less. Um, it's faster if you do more than 500,000 for sure, less than 500,000 USD investment. It's a little bit dicey in the Bahamas uh, to get the residency card there. You could just go and travel there and enjoy like what the winter has to offer in the Bahamas too. So if you want to just come check out the resort or invest in it, you don't have to be a resident there. It makes a lot of sense as your tax rates get a lot higher and your net worth gets higher. It's like, I can't not do it. I have to set up operations in the Bahamas for tax purposes. It pays for the, probably the entire resort, just in tax savings. But so the idea is you could spend 90 days there. You have to stay out of 120, 120 days is the maximum you can spend in the US to stay an alien. And you want to be a tax alien. You want to avoid the substantive presence test. So that's what the 120 days is about. So you can go between Bahamas and Florida for, or Bahamas and, and say like West Palm Beach or whatever in Florida. That's seven months a year. 